afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our 10th PHEI, the Public Health Ethics Intensive at Tuskegee University. The Public Health Ethics Intensive and the commemoration for the 1932 to 1972 syphilis study that took place in Macon County, Alabama, has been has, was put together um, for this exact purpose to commemorate the lives of those men and their families who suffered unjustly at a notorious syphilis study that took place right here in our county. One of the things that we should know, and we always hear, is that if you type in Tuskegee right now, one of the first things that will pop up is the Tuskegee experiment. The Tuskegee experiment was really the Tuskegee Airmen. And there's also a consistent way in which typing in Tuskegee will bring up an experiment as though it is a syphilis study and that the syphilis study was an experiment. First of all, it wasn't an experiment and it wasn't even really a study. If you're going to do a study, a study requires protocol. A study requires end results and it requires data and data sharing. These things were not done. What was done between 1932 and 1972 were men in Alabama and their family, uh, 623 men, 400 who were in the control group, um, they weren't given syphilis to our knowledge, but because there's a high concentration of syphilis in Macon County, these men were, 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 were believed that they were being treated for syphilis. They were told that they, were, they had what's called bad blood, which was a kind of um, tag word that meant anything that was bad in your blood, diabetes, anemia of any sort and so on. These men really believed that the United States Public Health Service, the United States government, was taking care of them. In the movie, Miss Everest Boys, and there's a whole lot of stuff in that movie that was not really correct, but nevertheless, one of the things that was said in that movie is that these men were susceptible to kindness. Understand, susceptibility can grant us both vulnerability and gullibility. They weren't gullible. They weren't, they weren't ignorant men. They were hardworking farmers. Um, they were hardworking Sharecroppers, they were hardworking, even educated men, but they were hardworking men who were taking care of their families and so on. But the United States Public Health Service came into Macon County, chose these men, and knew they had syphilis. And a few years later, about 12 years later, after they discovered the cure for syphilis, they refused to give them treatment. So this so called study went on for 40 years in plain sight, and no one did anything. To stop it. In, in 1942, after a whistleblower brought it to the attention, and after several conversations in the United States Senate led by Senator Ted Kennedy, and in 1997, after it was brought to the attention again um, to, to President William Jefferson Clinton, there was a move and a movement to, um, to commemorate to kind of ask for forgiveness, to begin the healing process of what was done to these men in the syphilis study and their families. Because could you imagine if you have men with syphilis, there is a great chance of contraction by their female partners and congenital syphilis to their children, which is still existing in their bodies today. So what, is it, what happened in 1997 is that President Bill Clinton um, gave an apology and then authorized the establishment of a bioethics center, a national bioethics center on the campus of Tuskegee University. And, and, and the purpose for the center in part is to ensure that this kind of violation never takes place again. So each and every day, what we do in the National Center for Bioethics in Research and Healthcare at Tuskegee University is we push an agenda that is public health sound, bioethics sound and new ethical sound to ensure that violations of this sort will never occur again. Certainly there was some good that came out of these, this horrific study, namely the institution of the informed consent, the institution of the, of the um, IRB, the Institutional Review Board, those are positive ends, and of course the National Center for Bioethics and Research and Healthcare at Tuskegee University. These are some good outcomes, but that, because we have these good outcomes, should never, should never take away from the, um, the repudiation of these kinds of things 
taking here, taking place ever again. It is our job and our task to stop them. This year, um, our conversation is going to be about women, leadership, and ethics. When we thought about 100 years ago, well, two things. <laughs> they came as a perfect storm. One was another pandemic, right? <laughs> that took place over 100, just over 100 years ago that took the lives of many people around the world. And secondly, the women got the right to vote, the women's suffrage movement. And we said, well, we don't want to celebrate <laughs> the, the pandemic, but we do want to celebrate that another part of democracy was kind of corrected because the language of women receiving the right to vote is an oxymoron. How do you receive a right? In a democratic society, you have a right, right? You're a taxpayer. You should have to march for a right to vote. 1964, 1965, the Civil Rights Amendment, the Voting Rights Amendment, Black people in America receive the right to vote. It's something really, really not, doesn't sound good about that. But nevertheless, we commemorate those women who, and men, particularly women who marched and who, who made arguments in defense of their right to be full citizens of the United States and their right to vote. 100 years later, we have so many women who have done so many great things, both before and since then. And we want to celebrate the women who have done these things. We have, uh, um, we have in history the, uh, a woman who ran for president, Miss Shirley Chisholm. We have Miss Barbara Jordan. <laughs> Do you all remember Barbara Jordan? Her voice was so powerful. You know, that's the kind of legacy that we have in terms of Black women. For so many women, like Kamala, Kamala Harris, for example, who was the Vice President of the United States, and and um, Stacey Abrams, and and um, and uh, Keisha, Keisha Lance Bottoms. Mayor of Atlanta. But right now, in our midst, in even at our university, we have so many women who are doing powerful and great things. And that's the conversation we want to bring to bear this week. So um, the first person we have to present to us is a friend of the Biorector Center. Every time we will call upon May Haygood, he has been responsive. He's a friend of the Biorector Center. He's a friend of Tuskegee University. And of course, he's our mayor, so therefore a friend of Tuskegee, the city. So may I give, may I give, we give you this time now to bring greetings to us and in any way you like and to say whatever you want to share with us. May I hate it. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hodge, uh, to uh, President uh, Mars, to Dr. Hodge and Dr. Warren and the panelists here, the, uh, the ladies representing so many areas of expertise and knowledge. I'm just happy to bring greetings on behalf of the citizens of Tuskegee, Alabama and the greater Macon County area along with Chairman Maxwell. Uh, we thank you. First of all, two words I want to say is thank you and congratulations. Ten years is a major accomplishment for the establishment of the Bioethics Center. It recognizes the challenges we had in the past, and as Dr. Hodge said, out of something negative, something so negative, we we're able to create something positive right here in Tuskegee, Alabama. And that's what we often do as African Americans. That's what Tuskegee has often done, taking what was not given to us necessarily in the best way, turned it around and made something positive out of it. So congratulations on that note to you for the positive impact that you're having, have had naturally, and I continue to have uh, for our people, for our community, for this nation, for the whole uh, world and area of science, ethics, and, and good information to people, which is so critically needed right now. That's where I think the key to me right now is to say to you, congratulations on the work that you're doing in HIV and other areas. Congratulations to the work that you, uh, for the achievements that you have in those areas, but thank you most of all for all the work that you continue to do. It may go unrecognized the level that you go to, first of all, to protect us so that we don't have a situation like that we had that occurred years ago with the syphilis study that came to Tuskegee. So thank you for protecting us, number one. Thank you for the research that you do which gives us better information from a scientific standpoint about what is available and what is good information. Uh, thirdly, I wanna thank you because what you're doing now is critical more than ever. With the pandemic that we have faced that has presented challenges to us in a major way, it is important that we get good information and truth from scientists and researchers 
who can relate it in such a way that people understand. We have so many people who want to discount what is good information. You need people who are in the community, who people trust, and who people can understand and relate to, to share good information. So thank you for that challenge, because it's not always easy, but it's totally necessary at this time, because we have the challenge of, yes, individual rights, but you also, we also have the challenge of responding to the need for public health. The greater public health is a concern. Everyone has a, uh, you know, a right to their own individual choices, but it has to be done in such a way that we don't threaten the public health. And that's what I've tried to say, along with other elected officials, that we have a responsibility to the greater public. Regardless of what the individual choice is, when we have the science, when we have the knowledge, when we have the recommendation to tell us what ought to be done, we're going to try to work with that to support that in however way we can. So again, congratulations. Thank you. I think it's a great uh, effort that you're making this year with recognizing women in leadership and ethics. I was uh, thankful for the opportunity yesterday in the Alabama History uh, and Archives in State Alabama at that major building right next to the Capitol. For the first time in history, two women were installed with bus made for two women because of their efforts in voting rights, Dr. Hodge, which you mentioned. One was Ms. Jacobs, a Caucasian woman who was a leader for voting rights, women's suffrage in the state of Alabama early in the 1900s. And the other was our own, who we claim, Amelia Boynton Robinson has a bus now in the Department of History and Archives in the state of Alabama. That is the first time any women have been put in that position and have had bus displayed there. So if you haven't had the opportunity, please take your family, please take your children to the Alabama History and Archives where you will see two powerful women there now who fought for suffrage in the voting rights and our own Amelia Boynton Robinson, who we've named Franklin Road after as Amelia Boynton Robinson Parkway. Again, congratulations. Most of all, thank you for your continued work. We need it more than ever. Truth is necessary. Strong people are necessary in whatever capacity you serve, as scientists, as attorneys, as educators. We need good information, and we need folks putting it out who know how to do it and do it the Tuskegee way. Congratulations to you. You're muted, uh, Dr. Hodge. Bob, mute. <laughs> Thanks, Ray, but Ray Higgins. And that, that was good karma for me messing with people on that mute button. Thank you very much, Mr. May Higgins. We appreciate that. Um, and we appreciate you sharing about the, the, the power and impact of women. You know, there's one of the things that um, will emerge this week when we talk about ethics is that there is, there is a, an amazing ethical theory that drives much of our conversation in um, care is what is called care ethics. Care ethics comes to us from feminist care ethics or relational feminist care ethics. And what feminist care ethics says is that there are two things that we know for sure. One is that caring is natural. And we could not be here if somebody didn't care for us and about us. Um, and typically that person is our mother. So if a person um, gives birth to a child and that child is not cared for in a natural way, then that child will not survive. And secondly, and secondly, that is, there's, one could derive an ethics from that. One could say, if a person doesn't do what is natural in terms of caring, then that person is acting unethically, in an unethical way. So therefore, um, what women bring to the table is an actual ethical system, an actual way of thinking about things. Is a, there's a wonderful book written several years ago called The Reproduction of Mothering, when the whole notion of what a woman does as a mother literally teaches us how to be the best versions of ourselves. So thank you, Mayor Hagen, for mentioning uh, those two giant women in our history. And they themselves bring such an empathic concern. In, 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 in the world of ethics, there's two kinds. There's abstracts, like what men talk about, and then there is relational. That's what women often can talk about, this notion of empathy and caring and compassion. Women bring that to the table. So we're thankful. We're thankful um, for those women that you just mentioned. Um, may hear good. Now, we have in the place of um, 
our provost, our interim provost, Dr. Agmat Aglin, he has sent to us um, Dr. Tamara Floyd Smith, and she will bring brief readings from the provost. Um, Dr. Smith, thank you so much for being with us here today. We appreciate your presence. Please share with us. Thank you for having me. Again, I'm Dr. Tamara Floyd Smith. I'm the Associate Provost and a Professor of Chemical Engineering here at Tuskegee University. It is my privilege to bring greetings on behalf of our ninth president, Dr. Charlotte P. Morris, and our interim provost, Dr. Heshmet Adlin. Welcome to the campus of Tuskegee University. We wish that you could be here physically, but we are delighted to host you virtually. Tuskegee University is known for great men like our founding principal, Dr. Booker T. Washington, and genius scientist, Dr. George Washington Carver. Tuskegee is known for the Tuskegee Airmen who were World War II pilots. Tuskegee is also known for the United States Public Health Service syphilis study. As Dr. Hodge indicated, the study took place here in Macon County and enrolled a total of 600 men. The study began in 1932, and in 1947, when penicillin became the standard treatment for syphilis, it was withheld. The story of the study broke in 1972 and set in motion a series of mitigation strategies to ensure that something like that could never happen again. This study is why we are here today at the National Center for Bioethics in Research and Healthcare, Women, Leadership and Ethics, Public Health Ethics Intensive Course. According to the description, this Public Health Ethics Intensive Course is an academically and professionally rigorous course for healthcare professionals, students, faculty, community advocates and others. In 1932, poor, illiterate African-American sharecroppers were exploited. On Friday, we will have the 24th annual commemoration of the 1997 presidential, presidential apology for the United States Public Health Service syphilis study at Tuskegee. However, exploitation still occurs today in susceptible populations. Therefore, we must continuously and intensely revisit our ethics, which are our rules of conduct or guiding principles. We must also celebrate accomplishments like the advancement of women. Thank you to the participants for taking time out of your schedule to engage in this course and other featured events for this week. Your time is very valuable. And it speaks volumes that you are committing multiple days to this critical topic. Thank you to the speakers and facilitators for providing guidance on this important topic. Thank you to US Congresswoman Val Demings for serving as the keynote speaker at the commemoration. And most importantly, thank you to the Bioethics Center administrators and staff for coordinating this wonderful event. Again, welcome to Tuskegee University and enjoy the event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Smith. Thank you so much. From um, I know you have a very very busy schedule as the is it assistant associate associate provost? Associate provost. Associate provost. Thank you. I know yes. you have a very very busy schedule trying to keep this university comfortable on running. And may Higgin, we know you have a very busy schedule trying to keep the city running. And so we encourage you, if you can, to stop by and, and check in on us as we go through this week of sessions. Um, um, but if you can't, we will have this recording posted on our website when it's all over, and you can go on and take a look. As a matter of fact, we have subsequent, uh, previous years on there right now of sessions that we had um, last year. We had, um, not last year, it was 2019, 2019. COVID has knocked my memory silly. <laughs> it's hard to keep up. But 2019, we had our um, 
400 year celebration, not celebration, commemoration of the beginning of slavery in 1619. So it was 400 years of, um, of uh, pain and trauma. And we have that up as uploaded at the website as well. So thank you very much and give our regards to uh, the provost and the president, Madam President Morris, thank you so much for um, sending officials to represent you in this, our 10th annual Public Health Ethics Intensive. Um, Mayor, I mean, Commissioner Maxwell is not on yet. We're gonna give him just a couple of minutes. And in that time, um, Dr. Smith and Dr. Uh, and Mayor Hagan, um, you, could, you could stay or you could take charge if you have the responsibilities. And then we will restart in just a couple of minutes. Thank you very much. Blessings upon each and every one of you. Assalamu alaikum, peace and shalom. Welcome back everyone. We are now preparing for our first session of our Public Health Ethics Intensive. Today, we have with us Dr. A. Ovida Fuller, and then her respondent will be Dr. Mary McIntyre. I will present to you Dr. Fuller. Dr. Fuller is an Associate Professor of Microbiology and Immunology in the Medical School and Faculty in STEM of the American Studies Center at the University of Michigan. She's an adjunct professor at Payne Theological Seminary and an ordained itinerant elder and former pastor in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. As a scientist who studies and teaches about viruses and which is a virologist, Dr. Fuller's laboratory team published studies in herpes, simplex, influence and influenza viruses. He teaches UM medical, graduate, dental, and undergraduate students about human virus pathogens, implementation, science research, and the trusted messenger intervention that she developed engages networks of religious leaders in communities of Zambia, South Africa, and sites in the United States of America to enable effective engagement in infectious disease prevention. He teaches at PTS where effective clergy should, what, if, what effective clergy should know about HIV, AIDS, and health matters, what effective leaders should know to graduate students from across the, the USA. Her University of Michigan study abroad course, Global Impact of, Global Impact of Microbes Free Work immerses participants in global research field sites to explore effective partnerships for advancing health. Dr. Fuller, you've done an adequate job in tying my tongue <laughs> on, on all of these things. I will, get, I will get even with you, trust me. <laughs> when, and when I start dropping ontological and theological, and uh, no, you know theological, ontological and um, what you call those things, epistemological um, terms. Uh, Dr. Fuller and I have presented it at different times together um, on, I think it was on the matter of COVID. I think we were presenting in some session. And so it was just quite an honor to be with you then. It's an honor to present you now. So we have before us Dr. Vita Fuller. Please let us receive her, Dr. Fuller. Thank you, Dr. Hodge. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here. I'm grateful for the invitation. Amazingly, someone just knocked on my door just as you started the introduction uh, for a delivery of, a, of, of, of something that is for our church for that we've been waiting for for weeks. So I'm hoping the noise won't be too bad as they unload this. But I am grateful to be a part of this um, celebration of the 10th anniversary of uh, this uh, uh, commemoration. And I just want to thank Dr. Uh, uh, Ruben Warren and Dr. David Hodge and all those who were involved in the invitation. Um, certainly the topic of women leadership and ethics is something that is uh, for this time, uh, for right now, as we are in a situation where the two unveiled pandemics of uh, both COVID and um, anti-Blackness in the world have brought together a, a, a new unique time that we can engage to make changes in the world for the better. And so for such a time as this, this, um, this Public Health Institute is really important. I'd like to just take a few minutes and, and um, 
uh, share with you some thoughts. Um, and then I, I think there'll be some discussion later. Um, when we think about the opportunities before us and the challenges before us, um, Dr. Hodge mentioned that I'm also an ordained minister. And I think of the verses of, of uh, Ecclesiastes that say there is a time for everything. And also of Esther, who was brought to a particular situation in her life where she had to make a choice. And her response after much prayer and fasting was for such a time as this. Uh, perhaps I would, she was born for such a time as this. And so she had to move forth and do that for which her life had been prepared. And she said, if I perish, then I perish. And so I, I think I'd like to bring to the table today the idea of trust messengers for such a time as this. And what I mean by that is people who have the uh, information, who have the contact, who have the um, uh, engagement with community, with their families, that they are trusted. They are people who folks go to, who folks believe if they say something. And I just believe there are many of these in the world, including our mothers and grandmothers and those whose shoulders we stand on. So before I go any further, I just want to lift up some of those people whose shoulders we stand on. You know, it's very popular these days for universities to do a land acknowledgement realizing that even in this month of indigenous um, focus on indigenous or celebrating indigenous people's heritage, um, that there's so many wrongs that need to be, be corrected. And so I want to stand on the shoulders of those women. Some Dr. Hodge mentioned earlier, uh, Shirley Chisholm, the first black woman elected to the US representatives, uh, Sharon Pratt Kelly, the first mayor of a US city. And, and these are all recent things, 1991. Carol Mosley Braun, the first, I believe, Senate, senator elected. Uh, and he mentioned Barbara, uh, Barbara um, I'm blanking on her name all of a sudden, but the, the wonderful Barbara who- from Barbara, Jordan. Jordan. Barbara Jordan. Hey, Barbara Jordan from Texas. And um, down to Condoleezza Rice and Susan Rice, and even to uh, Kamala Harris, our current vice president of the United States. We know many of these by name, even the president of uh, Tuskegee, uh, Dr. Charlotte Morris, who I think was recently made the, the uh, president after coming from an interim position. So we know some of these names, but there are so many unsung heroes, so many women whose shoulders we stand on, mm. grandmothers and mothers and aunties. Uh, my mother, Deborah Woods Fuller, who passed in May 2020 at, at 96 years old, who was a dedicated educator all of her life. Helen Siddle, Helen Brown, these are all people from my small county in North Carolina. I think of my mother, my grandmother, Lily Willis Grays, and my great-grandmother, Molly Fuller, who took her son, Bird Fuller's insurance money. He died in World War I. Um, and he died from the 1918 influenza pandemic. His body never was returned home, but he had insurance money. And my great grandmother went after that until she got it. And it was real, wasn't easy for a black woman to do that sort of thing in that day. But with that money, she and her children bought land in Caswell County that's still in our family and has been a place where we have been able to make a livelihood without sharecropping, but owning our own land planting our own crops, harvesting those, selling those. Um, my father and mother sent um, my, my father's seven siblings as well as their own three children to college. And so we don't take these things for granted. Those little decisions or what may seem not broadcast to the world decisions that mothers and fathers make about their families that make a huge difference. We think about the hidden figures like Margaret Fuller Foskey, who was an educator, Lois Curry, who was an educator, Posey Smith um, Williams, who's still living in North Carolina. We think of Katherine Johnson, who the movie Hidden Figures was about. I actually got to meet her when I was a graduate student at the University of North Carolina and uh, was looking for role models, people who wanted to do science. So we didn't see them in academia, but we found them in the Research Triangle Park and uh, founded a chapter of the National Technical Institute, which is a umbrella organization. 
Well, the closest organization was in Hampton, Virginia, and Katherine Johnson was a member of those. And I remember meeting her, and I remember in an introduction, she said that she was a mathematician with NASA. And I'm thinking, okay, how does a mathematician work at NASA, right? Having no clue as to what goes into the flight calculations. So when we saw the hidden, move, hidden figures movie and realized this was a person that we actually had had an opportunity to engage with, I was, I was just amazed that of the many things and decisions um, whose shoulders people like her who we stand on. So certainly people are born for the time they're in. And one of the things I want to encourage today is for my sisters, my um, daughters, um, those who see this is that step up to the plate for who you are and what you are. You don't have the right to put your light under a bush. You need to let it shine and be all that God has made you to be such that you can be a blessing to such a time as this. So I am grateful for my journey and those shoulders that I stand on. And so what I wanna do with the remaining time is um, just share a little bit about the journey from um, being a, born as a country girl on the farm in Caswell County, North Carolina, near a and University, about 20 minutes away, to being um, now part of the FDA panel for um, the vaccines and the many other opportunities that I have. So um, let me do that by hopefully sharing my um, slides here. And so this is the title uh, that I came up with for today, uh, was led to, to bring up for today uh, for such a time as this. Uh, let me make sure I've got everything working the way I want it to be. Doesn't seem like I can fix that, but that's okay. Okay, so trust messengers for such a time as this. And I wanna start at the end, which is a letter that I received from um, someone I don't know, Lisa, in December 12th after the first FDA meeting. Uh, I was actually contacted by someone who knew me from the International Herpes Virus um, Conference that happens every year uh, where I attend for the research that we do to ask if I would consider being vetted for the FDA advisory committee for COVID-19 vaccines. And I said, well, sure. I had no idea what I was signing up for because the vetting process is very intense. But after the long process of interviews and papers submitted to make sure there were no conflicts of interest, uh, we were brought aboard into the pool of people that could be selected. And then you are, are asked to participate on a committee according to the need of the committee and your area. After the first uh, meeting, which was a Pfizer uh, vaccine emergency use authorization, where 17 of the members voted no, voted yes to approve uh, authorization or recommend authorization, and four of us voted no. I was one of those four, and my no was not because of pediatric care, but because I wasn't, I didn't have the answers to questions that I wanted to ask, nor did I get to answer, ask those questions. So it was a no for a different reason. So this was received on the 12th. That meeting was on the 10th. And I'd like to read it to you because I think it gives an, uh, an example of how women and, and people of color need to understand the impact of small decisions like saying, yes, I will be vetted for this uh, FDA service. So she says, hi, Dr. Fuller. I just finished viewing your interview with Paula Tutman. I'm literally and surprisingly in tears. I was so happy to see someone, African-American and female, who looked like me, raising legitimate questions about the new vaccine. So many times we are made to feel as though we are logical or paranoid for wanting to know more information. Thoroughness and transparency go a long way toward assaging fears. I'm not a virologist or scientist, but I have many questions and concerns about what feels a rush to market for the vaccine. My trust in white scientists who may, share, who may not share the same risk as African-Americans and may also have questionable affiliations is quite honestly fairly low. She was being honest. She thought as many of us think. It was quite comforting to hear your very understandable and reliable approach to evaluating the science placed in front of you. 
I fear the great, I fear the virus greatly and have lost several friends to it. I'm willing to wait for more info information. There are questions about how long immunity lasts, if one can still transmit it asymptomatically, the small sample size relative to side effects and other considerations. I'd not heard those concerns addressed publicly before your interview. I really do feel like you represented us. The us for you could be the general public. The us to me meant my black self and those who look and live similarly to me. That is so important to me. It may sound cliche these days, but representation matters. I have known that for a long time. The magnitude of it hit me hard when I burst into tears while listening to and trusting you on this very important matter. You should know that I'm not a crybaby as a rule. I hope to see more of you in this matter and I hope others get to see you as well. Your plain talking on the matter is refreshing, understandable and surprisingly comforting. I was thinking about foregoing the vaccine altogether because of my concerns. Interestingly enough, you moved me toward considering taking it if and when more investigation and data is completed. You are the subject matter expert allow, you as the subject matter expert allowed me to hear you in a way I could not have heard a white scientist. It was a fantastic interview. Thank you so much. I appreciate you greatly. So I just want to say we stand then to do those things that have been done throughout history in understanding pandemics. Those mothers like my grandmother who in the 1918 pandemic lost a son to this disease, but from that came a livelihood and a way of, of, of self-determination for the Fuller family for generations in which I stand. The ministers who have come to uh, help people who are passing from one stage of life to another due to these many um, pandemics that have taken lives throughout history. And here we are now at another pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. It is not the first, nor will it be the last. But we do know from the data that the USA is one of the leading countries in the number of COVID cases and deaths. And when we look at that, we can see that that is not uniformly represented among races and ethnicities. And so here's what I know you know, but I wanna show you the numbers that if we compare to non-Hispanic whites, the number of, of cases or hospitalizations, the highest number surprisingly is among native indigenous Americans. Uh, followed by African-Americans, followed by Hispanics. Um, we are at greater risk of hospitalization, uh, but that doesn't surprise us. We know that in health, which is what today's discussion is about, we have many health disparities from higher percentage of strokes to breast cancer, to obesity, to maternal mortality, um, to prostate and cervical cancer, to HIV. I mean, we know these things. And the question is, what are we going to do about it? I believe we're at a time where we must all step up to the plate to say no more will this be tolerated. Let's dissect those things which include institutional and systemic racism and practices that allow these things to continue. Here's another way of looking at the COVID-19 disparity. Uh, here we're looking at hospitalizations, which I've circled, but we could also look at cases and we could look at deaths. If you have the white population as set them as one, then you see that for black Americans, we're two times, 2.2, 2.9 times more likely to be hospitalized, two times more likely to die from COVID. But even higher are the native people, the First Nations people. So we have to say enough of this. We will no longer do this. We will not accept another disease that has these disparities unless we begin until we began to seriously dismantle the systems that allowed them to occur. What are those systems? Why are African-Americans more likely to be affected by COVID? Well, we know some of them. The socioeconomic economical factors, the facts that our frontline jobs and the pay rates. Um, we are the ones who are doing the work when others can be home. Uh, we're the ones who are in the ongoing businesses when others can be home. That's what showed up in COVID. We also know about underlying medical conditions and there are reasons for those. The legacy from enslavement and the legacy of physical things that have happened that show up in our bodies, the legacy of stress even now 
as we navigate these times. Um, a, a black woman in America is more likely to give premature birth. And you think about that, that's simply the hormonal levels where we start out are much higher because of the daily stresses that it takes less time for us to reach the point where the body says it's time to push this baby out. And that's, that's something that when I first heard about it just really shocked me. But when I thought about the women that I knew who had early term babies, I thought, this is really true. We can look at access to medical care and there are stories about that, which I can go into if we have time. And then misinformation and culture. Uh, it's so easy for misinformation to spread, whereas seeking science and seeking it from people we trust is something that we have to learn to do. We can do better. We must do better. This, to me, then actually summarizes all those socioeconomical factors. And this comes from the legacy of enslavement in this country and the institutional and systematic racism that allows any inequalities and inequities to continue. I was shocked again when I saw this, but basically in the US and in the world, things come down to the almighty dollar. The word says the love of money is the root of all evil. And so if we look at this, it doesn't say money, it's just the love of money. In our capitalist society, what do we do? What do people do to get a profit? They will do almost anything. People were kept in enslavement, in bondage for years just to allow economic process, progress. And we see that that hasn't, that the economic gaps aren't getting smaller as we would hope. This was in 1990. This looks at the average household income of African-Americans and whites. And we see that in 1990, they were at this level. Um, but we see as we went into 2005 and then the 2008 economic situation, those numbers spread wider. With now in 2015, the numbers were estimated to be 750,000 in total household wealth, that's equities of everything for white Americans compared to 100K on average for black Americans. And this really explains all these factors that we look at. Uh, the institutional systems that allow these things to continue uh, have to be brought down. And we need everyone, women, men, uh, allies, um, everyone to do this. And I'm hopeful because the generations I see now with my children and children's children are making commitment that it doesn't matter who you are. So we want to change these numbers. And the last, I believe next to the last slide I want to show you, I, I'm going to skip that for now and come back to it if we have time in the discussion. The point being that we have vaccines that we should, as, as among the tools that we can help to use to get us past the current emergency so we can address these issues of income and inequities. Uh, we have boosters, we have the, the initial vaccines and boosters to help us keep the immune system strong. We now even have vaccines for our over five-year-olds, five and, and five-year-olds. So in summary, when we look at the COVID pandemic, my hope is that we're coming out of it, that if we can hold the line this winter, if we can keep from having a big surge because we're availing ourselves of masking and distancing, because people are getting vaccinated, um, we cannot allow another surge to come into place with another possible virus variant to come aboard. What do we need to do that? We need high individual back buy-in. We need transparency from scientists and physicians and others to talk about what we do know, but talk about what we don't know. We need inclusion. We need equitable access. We need community engagement. We need trusted messengers whose voices will be trusted by those they're listening to. You can influence a family member just by loving them and saying, I want you to do this because I want you to be around. The hospitals are filled with people who are unvaccinated. Clear messages, all of these build the trust that we need to get past the 2019 pandemic. So getting back to where we started, I want to thank Lisa for helping me to realize that the decisions that I make, which sometimes are not easy and sometimes don't gain me favor with people make a difference. And I just want to leave you with this wonderful book, which is called 400 Souls, A Community History of African Americans from 1619 to 2019. As we honor the 622 men who were affected in the Tuskegee 
syphilis study and their families today, those families who have um, built upon that legacy and who are still today trying to bring down um, the inequities and bias that allowed that study to occur. There's so much more we need to know. 400 Souls is an amazing book of 80 chapters independently written by scholars and others. Uh, you can pick it up and read any chapter and it's a complete story. We need to go back and get our history. We need to rewrite the history books. We need to let it be known that women and men of color and people of color in this country have given so much to the very soul of who we are as America. And so how do we go forward? I think we have to go forward together. I think we have to go forward knowing that we are in this together and knowing that if we do what we can do to make a difference one choice at a time, perhaps you are a young girl who was born, for example, one of our friends is 12 years old who was born when Barack Obama was president. Imagine when I was born, it was like one day we will have a black president. That is my dream. When she was born, she lived in a time when there was a black American as a president. So all kinds of possibilities are there. COVID unveiled a dual pandemic in the midst of the murders and loss of our brothers and sisters because of racism and police violence, in the midst of lack of access to healthcare that many of our brothers and sisters have to deal with on a daily basis. How can you know that you have diabetes if you don't have your annual physical because you have to take three buses to get to the doctor's office? If you miss one of those buses, then you get to the doctor's office late and your appointment is canceled. So how do you navigate that? You just don't get your physical. So you may not know that you've entered the diabetes phase. So we have to address these inequities. And I, I see the Tuskegee uh, Bioethics Institute as part of the solution by empowering people, getting information out, encouraging people, selecting people to give messages. And I am so grateful to have been one of those. Um, as a, a young girl growing up in North Carolina, my mother was a teacher, my father owned the farm. And as I said, they sent all of my uncles to school and my brothers, my two brothers and I. One of my brothers is an alumni of Tuskegee. He went to the vet school there. It's a funny story, when I was in um, college or, or early grad school and he was finishing Tuskegee and I wanted to come to visit for a weekend because I wanted to visit a new place. Do you know, he only let me come once. I'm not sure if he was trying to protect his little sister or what, but he let me visit once. And he kept such an eye on me. I thought, this is ridiculous, right? But I am so grateful to my older brother, who's the now retired veterinarian in Caswell County, and my younger brother, who's a professional engineer uh, in Houston, Texas, and to my mother and father and those whose shoulders we stand on. But the girls and boys and women and men out there who have a gift to give, and we all have a gift to give, we just encourage you to step up to do those things with courage and wisdom, which are being called for at this time. For such a time as this, we are called to do what we do and to do it well. Even as we come out of this pandemic, hopefully, there's still gonna be a need for mental and spiritual and physical, economical change and wellness. Everyone, every person can play a role in this. And so I want to encourage you to step up and do what you have to do what your calling is, what your gifts are for such a time as this. And we are all in this together and we will make a better, better time for all of us. Thank you so much. Um, and um, it's been my honor and uh, humbling privilege to be part of this celebration. Thank you very much, Dr. Fuller. We appreciate your presence and your words. That was very, very profound. Um, in the question and answer period, I got so I got so many questions for you, and I'm sure others have questions. We ask and as that you write your question in the in the box. Um, but you just said something to me. Said something, Doctor. Well, when you spoke about President Obama and young persons being able to see a black president in um, a couple of days before the election, I was on a plane headed to Chicago in uh, was it 2008, headed to Chicago and. Um, I sat next to an old gentleman, his name was Mr. Turdy. 
He studied, he just studied rats and erudite, and he just facing forward. So I just started making conversation. And, and uh, he told about his children, and he was in his 80s. He told me about his children, and, and he raised children in Chicago and so on and so forth. And then and he said these words. He said, I will not die before Tuesday. He said, I'm going up to see my family, then I'm headed back to South Florida to vote. I will not die before Tuesday. I have to live long enough to see a black president. And in the moment, I, we, we always thought it was great to have a black president, but it would be great to have a black president. But in the moment he said that, I saw how profound it was, especially for the older generations and equally the younger generation, generations. When he said, I will not die before Tuesday. And by the way, he didn't die before Tuesday. <laughs> he actually stayed alive long enough. Um, thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Fuller. Um, um, the, among the questions I have, I'm really interested in is you were just talking about the bus and uh, pe people would have to take, the bus ride people have to take and, and then they don't find out because of so much. I thought immediately about two things. One is um, uh, um, with the abortion, or the abortion laws in Texas as they now are, um, could you imagine if someone can get to the doctor in a certain amount of time, and whereas someone else could get to the doctor because they have wealth, then they are immoral for having an abortion at a certain time, and the other one is not. It's interesting. So I like your thoughts on that, and as well as clinics and the purpose that clinics serve. Um, so we get to. We'll get back to that. In the meantime, I want to introduce one of our BioEthics Honor students. Um, she is now on board. Um, her name is Cherish Hillman. I encourage you all the time to smile. There it is. Um, <laughs> she comes to my office and I beat up on her <laughs> on smiling. Um, but she's, she seems so practical. Her mind is always going. But Cherish Hillman has been in the program. She's a junior. Uh, right now in the over at the vet school where your brother <laughs> attended, um, uh, Dr. Fuller, and um, Cherish is interested in receiving her degree and her master's degree in veterinary, veterinary science, and um, we just encourage to have her. She's one of those biases honor students who is always willing and able and the first to say that she's willing to do something among the first to she's willing to do something to help us and to make sure she gets the best of this program. So coming to us right now to introduce Dr. Mary McIntyre is Cherish, Cherish Hillman. So Cherish, it's, the floor is yours. Hello everyone, my name is Cherish Hillman. Um, sorry. <laughs> It's very nice to meet you all. Um, I'm so glad to be part of this webinar and get to meet so many wonderful people and hear what they all have to say. Um, I wanna say, Ms. Fuller, that you did a very wonderful job with your presentation. Um, I would, oh, before I introduce this person, I wanted to point out that we did have a previous question from Will Christian. They wanted Dr. Fuller to pull up the second slide, the, the second to last slide from her presentation, if that's if that's possible. Well, we, let's do that. At the end. Let's, let's do that at the end, and okay. um, after Dr. McIntyre, so we can all reflect on it. Oh, okay. okay, okay. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. No problem. So. The next person I'm presenting, uh, real quick, I want to know how, how I pronounce your name. I don't want to get it wrong. McIntyre. McIntyre? Okay, thank you so much. So I would like to, oh, give me one moment. <laughs> I'd like to introduce the respondent, Mary McIntyre. She's a chief medical officer for the Alabama Department of Public Health and she's board certified in the public health and general preventive medicine through the American Board of Preventive Medicine. She also serves in various roles at the Alabama Medicaid Agency, including Alabama Medicaid Medical Director and Deputy, Deputy Commission, Commissioner of Quality and Standards. She is also a member of the Council of the State and Territorial Epidemiologists the National Academy for State Health Policies, Public and Population Health Subcommittee, the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology, and the American Medical Association, 
and the Medical Association in the state of Alabama. She also serves on a number of state and national advisory groups and committees. I need to unmute myself, but thank you so much, Cheris, for that introduction. Um, she didn't cover the part that I am also a mom of four, a grandmother of three, okay? Um, the teacher um, for our deacon's wives at, at my church, which is um, the Free Will Missionary Baptist Church. And um, I tell people above um, any and all things, I, I really work to try to make sure that we are doing the best we can for the by um, our population and get the information out. So I first want to say to Dr. Um, Fuller that um, your presentation was extremely insightful and motivating, um, and especially for any of the um, young women or, and older women that are on here. Um, and I also wanted to point out that we have a very similar background. I grew up on a farm in rural North Carolina, Granville County, Oxford, okay? Raised on the farm. I'm the oldest of four girls. Um, so I've got three sisters. Um, my mom was the youngest of eight. And it actually, we grew up on a property that was owned by her dad. We all grew up in the same home. And my father, um, they had a 10th grade education, but he came from a family of educators. My mom, on the other hand, nobody in her family had gone to college at all, but she did finish um, high school. So they really emphasized the need for us to get an education as far as being extremely important in order to move forward. So as the oldest girl, um, I was the first and everybody else followed. So all of my sisters also graduated from college. There's an attorney. Um, there's one that's actually involved from the standpoint of social work and um, working with patients with patient navigation, okay? And then another one is a teacher. So we all went into to various areas, but um, it was extremely important for us to make sure that we were assisting and helping each other. I wanted to talk specifically about, um, in response to this trusted um, forces and specifically, the your topic when it comes down for such a time as this trust mess, messengers i actually participated on a panel recently that was called trusted voices that was actually sponsored by the um fraternity the the aka's in birmingham actually in the park across from the street um in birmingham where, the, where we all know that that um young the young girls lost, uh, lost their lives so it's extremely important for us. And one of the things I've always done, even with my own children, I've got four, um, two girls and um, two boys. And I've always stressed to them the importance of always doing their extreme very best and that it wasn't all about them, that, that they needed to focus on what it was that they could do to help others. And they are actually doing a pretty good job at that. I've got one that's a teacher. So, and then others that are actually involved in healthcare as well. So. When it comes down to trusted voices um, and actually making sure people understand, I must say this, this pandemic has been, it's brought a lot of things out. And I tell people we can either take it and deal with, we need to deal with the challenges, but we need to see those challenges as opportunities. It's actually provided a lot of opportunities from the standpoint of working with people better um, and actually getting more down into the community level than we ever previously had when it came down to with working with the health department and public health. I've actually um, very early reached out to a lot of people from the standpoint of even before vaccines were even thought about were, were available, um, when we were actually looking at what was going on from the testing standpoint and all of the issues and problems, and especially with our people being able to get tested and looking at the numbers when it came down to the number of people that were being hospitalized. Um, and that was something that we had to really figure out how to make sure that we could get the resources to people. So I'm gonna quickly go over some stuff that when I talk to folks, one of the things I try to do with them is to meet them where they are, to find out specifically what their concerns are um, when it comes down to the vaccine 
and to try to address those concerns. Um, I am, when it comes down to folks here at the agency, regardless of who the employee is and outside with my church and everyone else, they come to me. They ask me questions specifically and they wanna know what is, you know, how can they find the answer? Um, what do, do they need to be concerned about or they have concerns and they'll say specifically, this is what I'm worried about. Um, so I, I have for years been that even before this because even within my family, I get, you know, as a physician, but also as the oldest, all of the rest I always call anyway. They want to know, well, what do I need to worry about? You know, we um, do I need to go for this exam and those things? So the COVID-19 pandemic, while it's being unprecedented in so many ways, you know, the number of deaths in the cases, the whole issue with the politicization and polarization that has occurred has made things even more difficult as far as with the volume and the rapid spread of misinformation and disinformation, you know, we've never seen anything like it. Um, and we can say, you know, well, it's a new world. We got social media, all kinds of social media and the volume of misinformation and disinformation um, that gets out. It is made even more, um, I, one of the advantages of what I say is an opportunity is it's actually made more visible what we knew were already existing um, inequities and disparities. Um, it's really hard for people to say they don't exist, even though they continue to do that. There are some that no matter what you say, will always say that, no, there's not a problem. Okay, those people, you know, you just keep on going and you deal with the situation and try to make sure that you can educate and inform the ones that you can. So it's made the disparities and equities more visible and definable, and it's been really hard to ignore. It's put resources that we've never had available from the standpoint of being able to deal with things um, that made them available so that we can try to do more. And I tell people, it's not a matter of try. This is an opportunity that we will probably not see again um, for a long time. So I wanted to deal specifically with what I call the biggest challenge with when it comes down to um, being a trusted voice and getting information out, and that's the misinformation and disinformation and the source of it. Um, I wanted to um, talk about, I have a shirt that I look on that I have that says, I am a strong Black woman because a strong Black woman raised me. Um, and, I, and I tell people stories about my mom, um, who, like I said, had a high school education, but that woman was rough. She was tough. And when it came down to things for her children, she made sure that um, pe people heard her. Um, and so I come honestly by that. And a lot of times it gets me into trouble. Um, but I tell people it's good trouble. Um, and we all know with good trouble. Um, we have to we have to continue to do what we know is right, regardless of what those consequences may be. Um, so recently, uh, and not just recently, really ongoing, there have been issues and concerns. But the challenge that's been the biggest is dealing with folks that you would think would be trusted voices, and people look at them as trusted voices but they are actually one of the biggest sources of misinformation and that's some of our of the physicians um, and some of the leaders like some of the legislators that we have in in alabama um we it, it's been a real problem and i've been one of those people that i have not backed off and explained to them i am 64 years old i am eligible for retirement and i really you know what what can they do at this point so i'm going to be the voice that some people cannot be because I need to make sure that we are heard, okay? And one of the things that we've had some of the most issues and stuff with is making sure that we got the resources where they needed to go. So we paid early attention. We started slow. Alabama always was in problem, uh, in trouble with being down at the bottom. You know, we, we usually are when it comes down to worse health outcomes and other things. But one of the things we did was we pulled people in early black mayors groups, the um, um, Alabama Council of Black Mayors, we pulled in and worked with 
the um, black colleges and universities. We worked with some of the community people. And what we did with doing that is we said, we need you all to help us make sure we can identify where we need to go and to get the resources there. So we use the social vulnerability index, but we also use people within the communities that other people church um, um, trusted. You know, the church leaders, the pastors, giving them information that they could use um, helping even having sessions to train them on what to say and how to ask questions. Um, because a lot of people were willing to be part of the solution, but they needed the tools and the resources to do that. So that was, I ended up doing more town halls, conference calls, um, Zoom meetings, all kind of stuff, training, whether we were dealing with the um, Montgomery Antioch District Association and all of their churches or with the Alabama Missionary Baptist Convention Group and um, trying to give them the information and stuff they need. So the biggest challenge with misinformation and trying to make sure that people can recognize the difference between information and trust and information that they need to ignore. Um, that's been a real problem. The, the trusted voices. So who are those? those when you've got physicians telling patients not to take vaccines? Um, when you've got nurse practitioners that are telling um, patients that you don't need to get children vaccinated, even though you may need to get the vaccinated, and this is why. So what we've done is we've had to make sure that we established relationships with groups that we can get that information out. And I'm gonna say this, you know, I basically told my boss, I said, I can do it because I need to make sure that people understand that this information is not accurate and that they need to look at where the information is coming from. What's the reference? Um, is this a .com site or is this a .org? Okay, a .gov site. Is this a group that's known, you know, where you can go out and they're talking about, and I'm gonna say this, that, that use the word freedom, um, really, really um, liberally, you know, this quite often um, as far as choice. And we all believe people should have choices, but we also need to make sure that people are informed and providing, um, making those choices based on accurate information and valid information. Um, so it's extremely important for people to see people who look like them. Um, to know that there are scientists, and that's one of the things that I have been trying to make sure people understand. It wasn't just white males doing the research on COVID vaccines. There was there were a lot of people that looked just like us that were doing that did the research and continue to do the research on these vaccines. Okay, and that there's probably not been one that's been more studied than the COVID-19 vaccines um, when it comes down to people being looking at what is going on and what the data shows and all of that information. And I want to actually tell Dr. Fuller, I, I, I follow, I have followed some of the FDA advisory meetings um, concerning that. And it is, and I told people who, anybody who believes that somebody is just, um, um, just putting a stamp on something hasn't actually watched the meetings because if you actually watch the meetings, you know there's a lot of discussion. Um, there's a lot of information, and when there's insufficient information, people say something. Okay, which is extremely important. So it's definitely not being rubber stamp. And I told people, I said, you know, if you watch and you sit six hours, eight hours, and you're looking at the, the communication going back and forth you can be assured that there are people who are asking questions that need to be asked about the data and making sure it comes back, which is why we can look at it and actually trust the vaccines. So the establishment of the relationships with the boards, I have been making sure that people know specific physicians, nurse practitioners, and examples of the misinformation that have been given out. Um, I don't have a problem if they even give my name and I tell them that. You can say that I sent it to you, 
but I give the information directly to the boards and I work with the associations. The other information is about making sure that we give those associations that information that they need so that we can make sure that there's a reference, that there are links, that they know where the information is coming from. And I tell people, when you have information being pre presented and it's one-sided, then you need to really think about why they're only given one side of that, which often happens when misinformation is being given. When the focus is on the fact that the vaccines cause a lot of side effects and there's no information about the disease itself, the number of deaths, the number of cases, if that is completely missing from the discussion, then the information is incomplete. So when you're looking at that, it's extremely important to do that. So trusted voices being identified in multiple occupations with consistent messaging provided, clergy, community leaders, nonprofit organizations within the communities, um, your healthcare providers, um, being able to target specific audiences and looking at that information. I wanted to give you something. There's an article that was just um, printed um, last yesterday and received, but um, I didn't send it, but I'll send the source. But it specifically looks at three of the Southern states, it's us, Mississippi, and I wanna say Louisiana, but it may have been Arkansas, but specifically at the fact that our percentages of African-Americans that's been vaccinated actually is, is higher than our percentage of white vaccinated, okay? at this point in time. Um, and they wanted to do the article because they wanted to know why. You know, we're usually at the bottom with everything, but how come you all have managed to get more African-Americans vaccinated than you did um, white? Well, we did that because that's what we set out to do and we focused on. We went to their communities. We went where they asked us to go, whether it was a church parking lot or it was a school parking lot in order to offer access to vaccines, okay? Because there are problems. And we even put together y'all with the National Guard and others, where we actually, with our um, home health nurses and others, when we had people who were basically not able to get out, we went into their homes, if that's what it took, in order to try to get vaccines um, given. Now, our rates are still too low as a state, but we're not the only one. It's, Mississippi, we all are low. But when we look at that difference and we talk about it, it's extremely important to recognize that a lot of the folks with the lower incomes, with the high SBIs, and if you go to the map on our website, you will see that Lowndes County, Lowndes County has the highest vaccination rate within the state. Why is that? It's because... <laughs> We drove that literally put the buses and the stuff that we needed into Lowndes County so that people didn't have to figure out where to go, okay? So if anybody gets an opportunity to go and take a look at the surveillance data and pay attention to it, and I tell people, uh, like you said, the focus effort and getting in and making sure that stuff is occurring is, makes a difference. So that people can't tell you that it does. And a lot of times folks say, we've done all of this and it didn't really make a difference. Well, we can see that it made a difference. And we can see that if you address specifically the inequities and the disparities, okay, that you can drive up the vaccination rates and you can get more people tested and you can provide the additional resources that they need, that's needed. So we even put in some Wrap around services to assist people who may be having problems with like food insecurities and other study, things that have occurred. Um, but it's not being utilized as much. It was, and a part of that may be because people need to know more about it. So help get the word out. There are resources. We're working with the United Way and we have stuff at the counties where people, if they're having issues related to the COVID testing, or let's say they end up being tested positive, or they end up having to be hospitalized, there are, there are resources for them to actually assist until they can get back up on their feet um, with certain resources. 
So that's pretty much it. For even with being, when we look at that, um, last but not least, has been the using the media, including the social media, to put information out. And because, and I'm going to say this, when I realized how significant the misinformation was coming from providers and all, I drafted an email, kind of like the one that a lady did to you, Dr. Fuller. <laughs> but I drafted an email, and my email basically talked about the fact that we were being actually, we were in a battle, and that battle was against misinformation. It's basically now been known. <laughs> we talk about, when we talk about um, pandemics, there's actually a, 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 a infodemic when it comes down to misinformation related to COVID-19 vaccine, which in Alabama has created a lot of problems and issues. We did with trusted voices, and I'm gonna say this, I'm gonna put this up. What do y'all see? I know that's kind of hard to see, but this is a, this is actually used and um, working with the voices for our Father's Legacy Foundation. When we talk about the public health services um, syphilis study, we actually got um, we actually got some of the um, family members. Okay, and remember we talk about because we heard about the syphilis study and why people didn't want to take this vaccine. So we had to get people to understand there is a difference between what happened with the syphilis study, which is not treating people versus a COVID-19 vaccine that has been studied in us, by us, okay, that's safe and effective and can keep you, the majority of us from dying. Um, we had to use people and get people involved and ask them to help us. And that's where the trusted voices come, come back in that we're talking about, Dr. Fuller. We're getting this and we've done all of this. We've used the ministers, we've done the PSAs, we've done the videos, we've got people talking to their church members. We got folks saying, look, I took it. One of them said, you know what? And when it wasn't available, I ended up with COVID-19. I made sure now so-and-so has it. This is why I took it. Um, so it's extremely important for us to do that and to, to use the information and those trusted sources. And we need to make sure that when we look at um, the people that are involved in getting the information out, because that email draft was put together, I sent it everywhere. I sent it to CDC, I sent it to the universities, I sent it to the ministers, I sent it to the associations, I gave it to the boards, and I sent it to HHS, and guess what? People started talking about misinformation and sources of information, misinformation, and how do we get trusted voices? There's a toolkit that was just released this morning by the U.S. Surgeon General, specifically dealing with information. It was embargoed. We had a meeting yesterday um, about it, but it was released this morning, and it's a toolkit to help people talk to other people. It's not just for physicians. It's for physicians, ministers, the mom who's trying to talk to her 20 um, some year olds who are determined that they are not going to take the vaccine. It's for people in the community, in the universities. Anybody can use it. Um, that toolkit kind of tells us, you know, how do we start? How do we we approach? What do we give? them as far as information uh, 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 or us? How do we make sure that they understand um, what the consequences of not taking the vaccine may be versus taking the vaccine, okay? I took my booster last, last what, on Friday, and I'm gonna be through, but I took my booster on Friday. I had to, I had to schedule it um, so that I would have, because with the second shot, had some side effects, okay? But, and like I tell them, I told everybody, I said, I've got to make sure that I can be well enough to be able to do this. So I've got to schedule it. So I've got a few days in case I go down. So I'll be back up because I know what happened with the second dose. But guess what? It could have been 10 times worse as far as the side effects. And I would have taken 
that vaccine anyway, because I know of too many people who are not here that are dead, okay, because they did not take the vaccine. I also tell people, I said, you know, when we look back, what where would we be if we had had the issues we're having with getting people taking this vaccine with smallpox and polio? Where would we be as a nation? You know, if, if where would we be? You know, think about some of us probably wouldn't be here because our parents wouldn't have made it. You know, they would be gone. Um, and I know that my mom lost a, a sister um, to the smallpox. So we have to remember that. And that's what I tell people. Think about what would have happened if we had had as much of an issue with getting people to take the vaccine as we're having now. So I'm going to leave it there. Trusted voices, you all are and can become and should be to someone. Um, there is somebody that looks up to you and believe, you know, and wants to hear from you. Um, and when they call, you know, point them to the right resources, give them the information related to that. Um, and the with my four children, I had two, I had no issues with getting the vaccine. I had two that one, well, one of them when they realized, because they know that when I speak, I mean exactly what I say. I said, you are not welcome in my home, okay? until you get vaccinated. And that's exactly what I said. I had one that had to test it. Um, and once he realized that he, and it was the youngest one, once he realized that he was not coming up in the house until he got vaccinated, he went and got vaccinated. You know, so, you know, we have to do what we have to do, but be that trusted voice to give that information out. Thank you. I absolutely agree. We have to do what we have to do for such a time as this, whether it's a trusted voice in our family or a trusted messenger on uh, media or uh, working in the communities with our churches, writing letters, whatever it is, it's, it's important that we engage for such a time as this. We are, we're so in sync. Thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Fuller. Thank you very, very much, Dr. McIntyre. Look at these, um, look as fashionable and okay to say this, these wonderful country girls <laughs> raised on farms. <laughs> and look, and, and, and look, you know, there, there's so much power in that. Um, and please post your questions and, and um, Ms. Hillman will read off questions as we post them. And I, was, I will get it started with a question or two, but there's so much potency in this. And um, I hope what we, I see here that we have several four, where with this honor students on here, they are male and female, but it's so important for um, young people to see that um, you, all are, you all came out of farms in the country, in places of the Black Belt, <laughs> the, the, the deep south of the United States of America. Uh, those, those farms may have been at one point um, plantations, and here you are representing um, on a very high, high level. And I'm from the United States Virgin Islands. <clears throat> um, um, and I'm, here I am working with Dr. Ruben Warren, the director of the National Center for Biorecious Research and Healthcare at Tuskegee University. And he's, a, he's from Watts. <laughs> he's, from, he's from over there where they had riots. And for us to be here now, uh, some 40, 50 years later, to continue telling the story that um, I think, uh, uh, I think Dr. Fuller, you may have said it. I think I heard you say it. Say in the beginning, or uh, it could have been um, um, our, our our associate provost. But anyway, if we are we are who we are because we stand on those who came before us. We are who we are because we stand on the shoulders. And when you describe your your mothers and your grandmothers and the fight that they had to go through and had to endure to ensure that we have these these opportunities. It's extremely powerful. Um, so um, while others put questions in the in the queue to ask and be free, be free to ask questions. This, we don't have this opportunity every every day. And so be free to ask questions. So I'm I see one the, question. Um, okay, yeah, the first the first question that's right is, is for is for Dr. Um, for Dr. Um, 
for Dr. Um, Fuller to put that screen back up there. But before we get to that question, I'd like to take executive privilege and ask, <laughs> and ask a couple of questions to both of you, um, because both of you touched on the COVID pan and the, the pandemic. And I, I want to, you know, obviously your work has been as an epidemiologist and as a, as a, um, a person, a virologist, immunologist, um, your work has been very in the center of this. I have to, one personal question. If you took a Pfizer, sorry, if you took Janssen or J, um, Johnson & Johnson and um, that booster is unavailable, is it okay to cross over and take Pfizer or do you have to stay with the one you just take? Anyway, that's personal. You could answer that shortly. But my question, the, my real question is, um, um, uh, both the FED, oh, Dr. Warren is here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, home! <laughs> you, you're the host. I'm joining you, sir. All right, all right, all right. Great I, I can hear most of you. Just couldn't see you. I've gotten most of the listening. So okay, that's great. Fun. And that's perfect. Okay, thank good. You. Glad, glad. Thank, thank you. Glad that you made it safely. I already told them that you had another meeting in Atlanta, and you made it here so safely. So we're excited. Okay, here's here's I got I got goosebumps. Look, I got goosebumps. So here's, here's, here's my question to Dr. Fuller and Dr. McIntyre. Um, is the question is a concern. The statistics were placed on the screen earlier about Blacks taking the, the vaccine. And of course, and you talk about Lowes County and how that led. And, and we saw where in Tuskegee, actually in Lincoln County, the, um, there's had overwhelming numbers of, of, of participation in the vaccine. And this was all good because what we saw 98.2 or whatever of those who were dying after the vaccine, they were dying, although 90% of those who were dying were dying because they weren't vaccinated or they weren't of the unvaccinated were dying. Right. Vaccinated were living. Okay, so here's my question to you. And it's a scary one, Dr. Warren, as public health and epidemiologist. Here's a question. So I think if I'm not, just a couple months ago, uh, I saw where 67% of, um, of the United States were vaccinated, or 66%, 67% of Canada, 67% of Europe, 65% in, in um, England, and so on. Only 2% in the continent of Africa. That is absolutely terrifying because it seems genocidal on certain levels. What would we have said if we had 67% of America um, vaccinated and only 2% of Native Americans who are living here vaccinated. Would we not have been terrified and say, wait, something seems, uh, something, something afoot? And of the 2% who are vaccinated in Africa and is public, the, 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 the additional struggle is that um, I had a wonderful co conversation, wonderful co uh, uh, colleagues um, of Harvard College, we meet with them each week and lock the forum. And he said, you know, the likelihood is that those who are vaccinated from Africa are probably in South Africa, where Dr. Warren and I visited last year. And, and we know in South Africa, we have a large white population. So then there's a great likelihood that those who are, those who are vaccinated in South Africa or in Africa are non-Blacks. The question is, uh, is this um, known information? And if it's not, what is being done, if you know, to bring correction to this? And how is it even possible to have over 50% in all these other countries vaccinated and 2% in the continent of Af Africa vaccinated? Yes, that's a that's an amazing uh, stat. Let me let me update you just a smidgen. It doesn't change it a whole lot, but the last data say that it's about 10% of the oh, of the continent. Um, so what happened was, of course, the vaccines were the right, the vaccines, if they worked, were brought up pre-testing, right? So the co countries bought vaccines without knowing if they worked. Um, and there was also supposed to be an agreement with the World Health Organization where countries would also contribute some large percentage of that to the center uh, COVID vaccine um, agency that would make them available for countries that could not, not afford to buy. Again, we go back to that almighty dollar, right? Capitalism um, is, if you look, follow the money and you will find a lot of the reasons for the health disparities that we see. Um, so 
the 10% is the level now, but that's coming from most countries receiving them from the central source. And yes, it is an atrocity. And yes, it is something, even as America approaches 70% of its people vaccinated or Europe, um, if we don't get the vaccine around the world and the virus is still able to spread and replicate mm -hmm. in other places, then we end up with the possibility of other mutants being uh, evolving out that will, will overrun the vaccine. So not only is it the right thing to do as an ethics issue, as a right thing, as a moral issue, it is if you're just plain old pragmatic and say, I want to be sure I'm protected from this virus and my people and my family here, then I need to be sure that those that everybody else in the world is protected. And I, I think that message is going out, as you mentioned, it was 2%, then it was 5%, and now the numbers we hear are 10%. When we have contact with people in Zambia and Malawi, I, I teach a class and a student um, in that class is from Malawi, a seminary course. So she says that people are crossing borders to get vaccines mm -hmm. when they hear that there's a vaccine. And of course, that means you have to have the economical basis, one, to know that it's over in Malawi if you live in Zimbabwe, and two, to go over there. So again, it's an economical issue. And it isn't genocide. It's just the, in my mind, it's not genocide. It's just the nature of human beings to be selfish and self caring and not to care about their brother, not to be their brother's keeper, which is what we are. That's why COVID has had, has had such a huge impact in America when we should have been able to put this under our feet from the beginning, uh, but we didn't because we wanna do what we wanna do as individuals. I care about my family, but I don't necessarily care about your family. That's what I'm saying the attitude is. Not that that's the case for me or the people in the community that Dr. McIntyre and I grew up in, because if you're, you know, you can take the girl out of the country, but you can't, can't take the, girl, the country out of the girl. So you are taught to care about your neighbor, that you are all in this together. If you've got a fresh crop of greens you, or tomatoes or fruit or whatever, you're going to share it with somebody else rather than have that sit there or try to figure out a way to make money from it. That's just- That's correct. That, and you're right. You know, we grew up where my dad did a garden enough to feed basically my mom's um, her aunts, my grandmother's sisters were all lined up. You know, we, they, one started down here, the next house here, the next one here, and then the up, other one. So when growing a garden, you supported, it was almost like the community. You had more than enough to feed, you know, us. So everybody was welcome to go and share to get the info. That's one of the things that's been, has probably bothered me the most about some of the information and stuff that I've seen is that people are so focused on themselves um, that we haven't gotten to where we needed to go. And I'm gonna tell you the current numbers with the US is 67.5% with at least one dose, fully vaccinated, 54.1% um, SCDC's website. And it varies a little bit depending on where you go, you know, to one of the university sites or whatever, but usually within a percentage point. In Alabama, we got 55% with at least one dose and 45% fully vaccinated. So we're still behind, but we're not as far as we were. And when it comes down to other states, we're not the bottom, even though we, we still have a long ways to go to get people where they need to be. And as I said, when it comes down to blacks versus um, whites, and then if you looked at the group that considers themselves two or more races, you know, they are way up. Um, blacks, 41%, and then whites, 39.5%. So we actually have a little more of us because we put a little more effort into trying to make sure we got to them because the percentage of people dying was so high. And let me say this, if you go and you look out on the website, there's a reversal of what happened last year from the standpoint of deaths and cases um, to where we are now. And what do I mean by that? It means that we have more white um, Caucasian people dying um, from COVID-19 right now. Um, and there is actually a divide as far as when you look at where they are with the groups and people talk about the blue and the red states and all in the thing, I can tell you where our numbers are the highest and what population, you know, when you look at age 
over 80 some percent of people in Alabama that age 75 and higher, um, right at 82 percent are vaccinated. Yeah. Okay. They ran and got those vaccines. They were okay? the most vulnerable. Yeah. Yes. And then when you get to the next age group, it's pretty, you know, consistent. It's just one percentage point off. So it's still over 80 percent. But as we get down younger and younger, we start losing the um, vaccination vaccination percentages. And depending on, and I'm going to say this, certain areas within the state, we've got fewer. But because we concentrated really hard and put the National Guard into the Black Belt area, into the Wiregrass area, those counties are darker, which means that more people are vaccinated. Um, and I think that's helping with some of what we're seeing from the standpoint of the people that are dying, which means it's few of us, few of, of us, and more on the other side. And a lot of that is also for when I go places, I don't know about you all, who do you see without the mask on predominantly? It's not us. We have our- That's all I'm going to say, okay? And I look and I'll see, and I'm like, they got to be 80 years old but they won't have a mask on. And I'm like, I've got on a mask, a shield, you know, all kinds of stuff. And I'm like, I just don't understand it. Um, I still, and I'm gonna tell you this, I still do not shop in the grocery store. Um, I order online, I ordered last night. So it would be delivered this evening from Walmart. I'm just telling you. Um, I stay out of um, locations and stuff that are really crowded and that I can't distance myself. Um, and I still continue to do that. And I tell family, friends, church members, and everybody who will listen that even if they're vaccinated, they still need to practice the preventive steps that we know that work. We were able to keep our, imminent, our um, flu rates down. When people were actually doing all of this, flu almost disappeared, okay? Um, so we know it works, even though there are still people that tell us and we have still fighting with folks with um, mask mandates and don't want their children to wear masks. And then you, you know, it's, it's all kind of stuff. It's, it's consistently an issue. And we just had the special session of the legislation pass all kinds of bills that basically one of them is, or they working on it. One of them will not allow anybody to mandate um, people being able to take a vaccine, but then we have a federal mandate. So then there's a lawsuit that's been filed. You all probably know all of this, but this is the kind of stuff that we deal with every day. Um, how to get information in the hands of people when you're dealing with all of the other background noise with stuff going on. Dr. McIntyre's brought up an important question. Right now, if you look at the people dying from COVID, it's typically the people who are unvaccinated. And a lot of those people are white Republicans who don't believe that COVID is real or that the vaccines are safe um, and who are so individualistic minded that the idea of someone having them. So I, I don't I don't I'm not saying that. Well, I am saying I think vaccines should be required in certain circumstances, circumstances. Um, but mask, I believe, should be required. And so if you can't wear a mask, then you need to stay home because that protects you and protects your community. We are, that's the problem with the U.S. We are so individually minded that we have lost our reasoning for what works. And that is killing people. So you, know, you could be callous and say, if you, we, God has given us vaccines, given us masks, giving us distance, giving us information. And if you choose not to use those, then your fate will turn out to be whatever it is. Now that sounds really cold and cruel, but the truth is if you're making decisions where you don't care about other people enough to do those things, then you, whatever happens is what happens. And even putting healthcare workers like Dr. McIntyre and others at risk with our medical centers and all these places, people are so burnt out. So it is the right thing to do is to help yourself, to help others as we try to move out of this pandemic. We've gotten so far away from the fact, and this is what I said, whatever happened to the common good? And I've said this and put it on post on my own Facebook posts and other stuff. You know, you know, when you're looking at what is going to get us ultimately out of this versus I don't want somebody telling me what to do. And, and, that's, and that's the whole thing. Some people have gotten it 
buried into the fact that nobody tells me what I need to do, but you getting away from the fact that it protects you to do it as well. Okay. And you protect others by doing it. And let me say this with our children, it is a big issue with, um, with some of the groups here in Alabama who are basically campaigning and saying that children should not be vaccinated. Um, even to the point of the attorney general, our attorney general at some point sending a letter with two other states signing off on the fact that the COVID-19 vaccine should not be given to children. Now, this is before the FDA thing approval, but we still have some of those same people against vaccinating children. And let me tell you all this, the information and stuff that is available, there's a question that said, did you have apprehension about the vaccine? Yes, I did initially. But you know what I did? I do what I always do. I go to the people I trust, okay? And I also go, I read a lot. I probably at this point, I've read over 200 articles about everything from the um, the um, breakthrough infections versus reinfections when people get the disease, how much better off you are if you, even if you had COVID and you take a vaccine versus not taking a vaccine because you got immunity, natural immunity, so you don't want to take a vaccine. Well, I done read all of that stuff and guess what? Even if I had had COVID and I tell people who I know that did, I tell them, go get the vaccine, okay? Boost your immunity. Yes, you may have natural immunity, but you don't know how good it is. I have a daughter who is immune compromised, who is on medications with injections that lower her immunity. She's had her third um, additional dose because she's immune compromised, but Everybody, and that's what I tell all of the rest of them, and that's what with my son was, for no other reason, you need to protect your sister, okay? You don't want to be vaccinated because you believe you're at low risk, but she's not, okay? So do it for her. Do it for our younger kids who are too young, the two-year-olds, three-year-olds that I, I'm, you know, great nephews and nieces and, you know, grandchildren that's too young. Do it for them, Get the vaccine to protect them. And the ones who can get vaccinated, get vaccinated. Yes, there are side effects, okay? I took the vaccine on Friday and was in the bed Saturday and Sunday, but I'm back up, okay? I'm still here, all right? I haven't ended up on a ventilator where uh, somebody has been uh, put on the ventilator for three weeks, four weeks, and still didn't make it uh, on an ECMO machine. And by the way, at one point, we ran out in the state. We didn't have one available, okay? Um, somebody, one of the ladies called me because she knew me from church with her mom needing an ECMO machine and trying to figure out where in the surrounding states there was one. And this was at the height when we had climbed up to almost 3,000 admissions a day. And guess what? There wasn't one, okay? Um, and there were people dying who didn't have COVID because they couldn't get into couldn't get medical care. They couldn't get into the ICU. Yeah. They had one with a stroke, a, another one with a heart attack that I personally knew. They couldn't get, they, one of them, they kept in the DR for 24 hours and managed to stabilize them, okay? But this is what happens when people are only concerned about themselves and, and they're not thinking about happened. everybody else. And that's what happens in the U.S. That's, that's even with the, uh, recent approval of the a vaccine for five-year-olds and up. Mm -hmm. um, the question was, um, do we really want to do this for our children? And you may not know this, but our our uh, FDA committee has been a target of a major email and phone call campaign sure. to say, don't approve it. And it's like, how can you not, the option is there, it's shown to be safe, it's shown to be effective. How can you not offer this to parents mm -hmm. who want to protect their children? If you don't want to use it, that's your choice, but it needs to be there. I would like to answer the question in the email or in the chat. Also, did you have apprehensions about the vaccine? Um, I actually am a big vaccine advocate. I, I work in Southern Africa, as uh, Dr. Hodge mentioned. And so I've had almost every vaccine that, that is available that works, that's effective to protect you against disease. And so I wanted to know, um, uh, 
some answers about the vaccine and, and ultimately Moderna came along the next week and gave a lot of the answers that we didn't get from Pfizer. But I still wanted to wait a few weeks and see what the rollout was. But the more people got it, the first time I had an opportunity to get it, I hesitated. And when I went back in, those slots were gone. They were, there were no more at the university. So a couple of weeks later, more arrived and I went in and I went ahead and, and made my appointment. And at the day of my appointment, I talked to my husband. I don't like to put anything in my body, right? I mean, I don't even take vitamins unless I need to, uh, which I do. I do take them because I need to. But the point was that, am I ready to do this? And he said, well, you really probably should go ahead and get vaccinated. Um, if I were my mother at 96, I would have taken her the first time. But for me, because I was home, it wasn't such a high party. But I did. And I said, God, if there are long-term effects that we don't know about, then just protect me from them. But I'm going to go ahead and do this. Mm -hmm. And so I think the, the apprehension I had wasn't so much about it being um, made by somebody or whatever, just the fact that it was a new thing that had not had the rollout that we now have. This has now gone in millions, millions of arms, billions of arms even, or millions of arms for sure. And so therefore we know what the side effects are and we have systems in place that when something goes wrong, like with the J and J with um, thrombocytopenia, we pick that up. Mm-hmm. And there, there is, there, that says the system is working. It's not perfect it's working, but it's working. It but we have work. to use it. We have to be part of it. So yes, I had apprehensions, but um, okay. once I saw people that it was fine and I saw what COVID was doing, COVID was not only killing people, but dismantling people in terms of long COVID or coming out, surviving, but being on dialysis or having brain fog or having heart issues or other issues that are a result of this one little virus, if the vaccine can help. And by the way, just so you know, natural immunity, if my hand is the virus, it makes the immune system responds to every part of it. With the vaccine, it responds to the thumb, which is the attachment protein. I use this analogy often. The thumb is what attaches the virus to cells to let it reproduce. So the vaccines are directly made to the thumb. So it's focus, it's like very focused protection against getting the virus into your body, whereas natural infection gives you immunity to lots of things. And some of that's not really important for the initial infection. So the, the vaccine is so much more potent in protection than is natural immunity, which is useful, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't cover the things most critical. Are there other questions, uh, Cherish or, or Dr. Hodge? Um, you, I know you, there was a question about a slide. So, um, we, do have, we do have a few questions in the queue. Right. Um, there is still the original question from Will, Will Christian asking Dr. Fuller to pull up the second to last slide from the presentation. All right, let's do that now. I think I, I, think I have it here. Uh, second to last slide. Uh, actually, let's let's go back. Um, let me go ahead with the next question because I'm I have it on a different screen and that doesn't help you. Okay, the next question is for Roosevelt Bombs for Dr. Mary McIntyre. Where can I get the toolkits? They also want to ask you to see if I can get the link and put it um, for you in the um, chat. So let me look for that and um, hopefully I can pull it while we're still on here. Okay, but I'll okay. include it in the chat so that people can get to it. Okay. Okay. Let's see. And I think I have that slide now. Let's let's try it again. Um, is it this one? Let me let you tell me which one it is. Um, so there was the book. There was how do we go forward? The book, the letter the summary, and then the update. This is one I really would like to share with you. This is, I think, what Dr. Hodge was asking about. Yes. Um, so what we have is uh, a summary, uh, update on vaccines and boosters. And let me say COVID-19 is a deadly virus that can do everything from asymptomatic infection, meaning you're infected, but you have no symptoms, you feel fine, but you can spread it to others to mild disease, which means like you have a really bad cold, to severe disease, which means like you've had the worst flu in your life and you hope you survive it, to 
um, severe disease where you go to the doctor hospital in the ER and some people don't make it. Um, and if they do make it, there are long-term effects. The vaccines have been shown to protect against disease. Um, symptoms, mild, moderate, and severe disease. In the hospitals now, 95% of them are unvaccinated people. Um, and even though people get breakthroughs, they're typically mild infections for those who are vaccinated. So here are what the vaccines are. Um, the five, there are three that are approved in the US. Two are emergency use, Moderna and Janssen or J&J, &J, and Pfizer is now licensed um, in the USA. Those vaccines are, there are two of them that are messenger RNA, where we're putting in the little, the gene or the, the sequence for the spike protein that Thelma I showed you in two doses at 21 days apart for Pfizer, two doses at 28 days apart for Moderna. And we're seeing now that these numbers and these amounts, Moderna is three times the amount of messenger RNA of the spike as, than Pfizer. And we know that most of the breakthrough cases of vaccinated people are with Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer, very few with Moderna. So this has the strongest impact and it also may have more adverse effects, um, side effects initially, but it does work very well. So those are what the initial vaccines are. And so here's what happened with the boost. Um, and what, it was sh what was shown is that over the course of six to eight months, the levels of protection from, from uh, mild disease go down with all three of these vaccines. They still protect against hospitalizations and death, but that, that there are more people showing up uh, with mild symptoms that are vaccinated. And the data show that the immune response isn't as strong as it was when we first got it. So the goal then, which happens with many vaccines, remember with measles, mumps, rubella, you get a boost, right? Uh, with hepatitis uh, or, or um, human papillomavirus for children, you get a boost. You get two or three shots. So here, here's the boost. Um, with Pfizer, the boost, so after you've been fully vaccinated, you get one additional dose that is the same dose as the original one, and you get it at least six months after your second dose. It could be more than that. I got mine at about eight months after my initial dose. With Moderna, the boost is, is half the amount, and that was studied in long-term studies to show that half amount stimulates the immune system to go back up to that high level of protection. With J&J, &J, which originally was only one dose in the first place, you got one shot, you were done, and you got up to about 75% protection. The results show that you can get a second shot within two months, which will move you up into the 90 percentile. And so that's oh what's God. recommended now, that with, if you got J&J, &J, that after two months, you go and get a, a, a boost. What can that boost be? Well, you can mix and match. Why? Because all of these give you the same spike protein. The identical protein is expressed in your body in different, from a different platform, but it's the same thing. It's like saying, I'm going to serve you pound cake on a china dish, or I'm going to serve you pound cake on a paper plate, or I'm gonna serve you pound cake on a napkin, but it's all the same pound cake, right? Um, so that's what these do. That means you can mix and match. You get, if you had Pfizer, you get your vaccine, after your boost after six months. If you have Moderna, you get it after six months. If you had Johnson & Johnson, you get it after two months and you can get any combination of boosters. I would not recommend Johnson & Johnson after the message RNAs, which I can go into only because the, the virus that carries it, you may have immunity to it, but you can get Moderna or Pfizer after either one of those. So I don't know if that was the slide you wanted um, or if it was if it was this one. Um, so can you let um, me know? Well, Christian did say, yes, that is the one. Thank you so much, great presentations. I feel empowered by their presentations. So it was the one on the boosters? Yes, I believe so. Go back. Please go, please go back. Okay. Oh my it's God. Oh my God. I, now, I, now I feel so bad. I'm in trouble. I'm two months away. I'm, <laughs> I thought, I didn't realize it was so close. That means I need it right away. So um, well, I it, think it's okay. Let me say, it's all right. This is a recommendation. You still have strong immunity. 
uh, this, it's not like it runs out. It's not like your previous immunity is gone. It's just that it may not be as um, as strong as it was. It's still I need will, strong. I need strong. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you might get a bad cold. You might get the sniffles. You might, you know, feel like you're coming down with something because your immune system is fighting it. But once you get the booster, you're now back up where the Dr. virus. Dr. Warren, you don't listen to them people. We need to. <laughs> yeah, go get we, your booster. We, we need to get that booster. Out, right right early. We need yeah, to get that booster. I, I don't even want to sniffle. I don't. <laughs> I don't want. Listen. listen you got the message. <laughs> listen, the, the side effect of, 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 of the vaccine is a sniffle or pain arm. The side effect of the COVID, a side effect of the COVID is a funeral. I don't want that. That's don't right. Want that you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. Go get your boost. Go get your boost. <laughs> yes. And there is a question in there that actually I put the answer live that talks about the argument with family and friends about taking the vaccine. You still get the virus um, that you can still get COVID. Let me say this to everybody. Um, the in our hospitals, and these numbers we have, we looked at repeatedly over and over, and it just wasn't just in Alabama. This was throughout the country. The people who were dying, the let me, first let me start with the majority of people who were in the ICU on the ventilators, let's start there, um, were guess what? If there were 10 people, nine of them were folks without, that were not vaccinated. Vaccinated, okay? yeah. Let me say that. Yeah. Let me say that. Okay, so the yes, a few people vaccinated. One out of ten did get sick, got admitted. Okay, and some of them died. But guess what? The majority of folks who were hospitalized and dying were people who never had any vaccine. Exactly. Okay. That's correct. That's correct. So the and the ones who did were vaccinated and died were the ones that had comorbidities or they were older. They were the immunocompromised people, which is why the decision was made to get them another dose as soon as possible, because those were the ones we were seeing being hospitalized, placed on a ventilator, and not making it that were vaccinated. Now, Daryl even with my Powell daughter- is an example. Someone who was vaccinated, but hadn't gotten the, the, yes. the boost yet. He was, yes, he like- had multiple myeloma. Yes, cancer, myeloma. yes. But guess what? Not taking the vaccine puts that, the, the, that group of people at the even higher risk. Right. So for my daughter, uh, she understands that she's probably at least not now going, she cannot come she cannot just go freely into crowds. She's going to have to continue to wear her face coverings and to distance herself, okay? And to do all of the things with the extra steps because the vaccine is not going to get her the level of protection that it will get the rest of us who are not immunocompromised, okay? So we still have to protect her, which means that the people around her need to be vaccinated and she still needs to take precaution, which means that she has been vaccinated because guess what? Protection, some is better than none at all. And let me give you an example my sister did. She's so funny because she's got, we all got health issues, but anyway, she, she had to use the blood on the post, on the doorpost example with one of her, some of her church members who said that God will protect them. I'm going to say this, y'all. I am I, and I, I am a strong, I have a strong belief and faith. But you know what? God also puts people here to help us. Absolutely. Remember that. Okay, let me say this to you. The vaccine is a resource. The other steps are resources and tools. And who the people had to take a step in order for the firstborn not to die. They had to put the blood of the lamb on their doorpost. Y'all remember that? Come on, come on. <laughs> okay, come on, in order <laughs> to save their children, so it would pass over. Death would pass over. Okay, so we have to. I'm sorry, y'all. Come we on, we have to take step and action. Okay, and if the if there's a um, vaccine available that's safe and effective, and there is, okay. 
Um, there is not a single thing I know of from a medicine standpoint, even aspirin and Tylenol have side effects. Do y'all know that people die right. taking aspirin and Tylenol? People end up with liver failure if they get too That's much right. in. But what? People still take it. But people will work. not take a vaccine that <laughs> will most likely save their lives. Okay. And that's when I look at them and I go, so y'all going to wait like the person with the boat. Y'all remember the person in the boat that kept waiting for to be saved for God. God to send send to save <laughs> y'all remember that? In the boat. <laughs> for God to send somebody and then we ended up, he said, well, I was waiting. He said, I sent you how many times? <laughs> and you just kept sitting there. Don't keep sitting there, y'all. I, like I, the next I, time, I, I tell those same stories about the blood on the doorpost and the <laughs> God. God is sending us a, a, a answer. We just have to be obedient enough to hear and use it. I, That's what I I'm, love, I'm sorry, I, but I, I had to go there because no, I'm like, I, I, go there, go there. I, go I there. love, I love hearing such level of genius saying y'all. <laughs> <laughs> what does it take? I've even asked people. I have looked at them and I have said individually, I said, what will it take? Okay. Right. Tell me, what will it take? Okay. And who do you trust? Because I'm going to tell you, some people will say, well, I don't trust you. You work for the government. So who do you trust? Tell me, do you trust Mayo Clinic? Do you trust Harvard University? Do you trust UAB? Do you trust Tuskegee? I am going to go to your trusted voice, and I'm going to get you the information you need. And that's what I do. And then they look at me and I'm saying, well, you say it, you didn't trust me, but you trust here. So here's the information from the people you trust. Oh, oh, Doctor, wait, wait one second. And Dr. Uh, Miss, Miss Lily Head, Miss Head, uh, uh, of the, the president of the Voices of, of Our Fathers, God bless you for being on here today. And uh, she, she started a question, but... Um, uh, Ms. Head, you put it in the in the um, in the um, the dialogue section, but we only got Miss McIntyre, so we don't know what the rest of the question is. If you put it in your question in the um, oh, there it is. Wait a minute. No, that's a that's a. But I, I thought you had a question. But um, if you have a question, Miss Head, can you please put it in there? In the meantime, um, and we got um, um, Cherish. Are there any other questions that need to be read? Yes, we do have a few more. Okay, sure. Go um, ahead. Looks like um, Dr. McIntyre answered Rebecca's. So, Will Christian actually has a few more questions. It's, the first one is What are your concerns about the oral medication for COVID? Yes, so that's actually uh, going to be reviewed at FDA coming up. Um, I, I've actually been tapped to be on that particular, it's a different advisory board. So, we will look at the data and um, We'll know when we know, you'll know, but if there's something, what I understand is it's a, it's a drug that can be taken early in infection that will prevent severe infection. Uh, whereas now everything that has to be given is given IV in the hospital. This is something that people will be able to do at home. And again, as Dr. McIntyre says, it's another tool in the toolkit. It's another uh, thing that God has allowed to come that we can use to protect ourselves if we will use it, if it's approved. And you know, we haven't, I haven't seen the data yet, but um, I'm hoping that it will, it, it has been approved in Europe, uh, something similar. So I'm hoping that the studies in America, which are the toughest in the world uh, to get approval will go through. Let me say this, and this is what I tell people, if there is something that potentially can prevent the majority of people from getting the disease, go with prevention. I'm gonna go with prevention versus trying to, treat something once I have it to make it uh, lower. And like I say, even if uh, some people still get infected, a lot of people do not end up with COVID-19 with the vaccine. Remember that y'all. And the pills, I've seen some data, Dr. Um, um, Fuller related to it. And um, I mean, it's pretty good, but it's not a hundred percent, just like the vaccines aren't a hundred percent. And there's yeah, we need all of it. And that's what I tell people, even with the vaccinated, when we had folks that were, we end up with disease and especially if they were immunocompromised, I told them, you need to get in touch with your doctor as soon as possible so you can go ahead and get the monoclonal antibodies, okay? Um, because 
you still are at risk. And I had already educated my daughter and I explained to her, you're doing all of the things you need to do to prevent it. I have had my third, my booster dose on Friday. Even before that, with my two doses, I have never stopped wearing my um, mask. And I'm in my office with my door closed now. If I come out of the office and I go to the bathroom, I'm gonna say this, my mask is on me. If I get in the elevator to get my mask is on me. There's a question about, do you still wear the mask when you're fully um, vaccinated, even with the third booster? Yeah. I will. Okay, now I, I, know also. <laughs> I know there are some people who, who want to pull them off, but I'm going to tell you this. I, until I am, a, you know, until we, transmission is, has gone down to under 5% in Alabama um, right now, but it's still being transmitted. People are still dying. Our numbers this morning with the number of deaths was 48, 45. 45 deaths reported this morning. I'm telling y'all that there's still a lot of people dying. Okay, so no, I'm continuing wearing my mask. I go, I had pulled my, put myself back in church and then I pulled myself back out of church going, um, even though we reduced our numbers way down and everybody has to be messed up because when the transmission rates got high again, I told my pastor, anybody who is older um, with more comorbidities that put them at a higher risk, um, immunocompromised, they really need to go back to the house until the numbers go back down. And then I'll let you all know when it's that when you can think about coming back to church, which is what I did. Okay. So they were like, okay. And I would like, I, um, I'm going home, you know, that's a choice that you all can make, but I'm going to the house and I'll come back. So I'm back now. Okay. May I just be, make it as crystal clear as we can about the mass. So what we have are a number of tools to reduce the possible exposure to COVID as well as to stop it if we get exposed. So the tools that keep us from being introduced or encountering the virus in the first place are distancing, masking, and staying at home or staying out of crowds. Those things keep us from being exposed to virus. Um, the things as well as other people wearing masks such that if they're not knowingly infected, they're not putting it into the environment. That's prevention. And then um, the vaccine helps us if we are exposed to virus from being able to replicate in our nasal passages. Because the sooner we see it, if we are already have defense against it, we can say, nope, not, you're not invading this body. And so even if we are exposed, we don't get infected. And then the third thing is the things that happen once we are exposed and the virus is in our body, we have the treatments, the monoclonal antibody therapy that Dr. McIntyre mentioned that you have to get in the hospital via IV early in infection for to keep you from getting to severe infection. And we're hoping to have some medical therapies if they are approved that will also do that. But the best thing you can do is to do the pieces you know work, which are masking, distancing, vaccining to protect your body to make sure it's prepared such that if you see this virus, you will be able to deal with it and to encourage everybody else. Because if we do that, then the virus numbers go down in the communities, which means that we don't have as much to come in contact with. So that's why we're all in this together. It's not an individual thing. If Dr. McIntyre in Alabama and me in Michigan do this, but other people don't do it, it's still not gonna work. We gotta oh. all do this diligently, especially over the next three months as we're in the winter time, when people are together, they're traveling, they want to travel for holiday, and I still encourage you, you don't have to, don't. Um, it's still a good idea to put the, that mac and cheese on the front porch and let them come by and get it, <laughs> as opposed to having people come in your house that you don't know a vaccine. I mean, you're laughing, but I'm very serious. That's powerful. You know, but you know what? Still, Let me tell you. Mine we are be. still in the middle of this pandemic. I know it. I'm going to give it an opportunity to research. Let me tell you what. I, yeah, I don't put it on the porch, but I've got sections for everybody. Um, they, they actually contacted me and said, Mama, are you going to actually do, because we did um, a Zoom um, holiday thing where everybody yeah, had to too. fix their own food and then we all yeah, my husband did the group prayer for everybody we all were on zoom that's what we oh, did that's nice i told them that this time i will actually cook but what i've got is sections for people who are in the same house okay where they have to sit 
So we're not putting people together. All of my folks are vaccinated who can be vaccinated, except right now, the five-year-old still will not be fully vaccinated by the time um, the Thanksgiving comes, okay? So I've got a section for this house, a section for this house, the, the things over here. So we don't group them together. And when they come in, there's still a thermometer that people have to do in hand sanitizer when they come through the door. That's right at the door. I'm not stopping that, y'all. Okay. And so when people look at me, I said, I'm sorry, but I got stuff hanging on my purse and everything else. Okay. And it's not like we want this to be the case forever. The coexisting with COVID may not involve these, this level of precautions unless the level in the community goes up. When the level is up, then we need to do everything we can. When the level is low and we keep it low by keeping it down, then we be, we'll have more freedoms. You, you may be able to have a family dinner and not have to section off people or not have to, to uh, do a rapid test as people come in, but we gotta get there and we're just not there yet. We're on our way, but we have to all do these things to get the virus down and keep it down from mutating around our vaccines. We can do this though, we can do this. It's a question that I didn't answer about, can you be a carrier of COVID after being fully vaccinated? Unfortunately, there are some people who yes. can, um, and that's how you can also still get COVID even though you're fully vaccinated. It happens less often, often, but it does occur, okay? Which is, and usually, and I'm going to say this, the majority of people end up with mild disease, but that's why you need to do the other stuff that we, we just talked about again the other all of the tools in the toolkit the more of them that you use the more um the less likely you are to end up infected and infecting someone else okay um so that's why it's so important we do have another question but it looks like attorney brian has something to say and they want to say for a bit no i'm good oh. Oh, okay. Hand hand is, uh, that's why we thought that. Yeah. My bad. My bad. No problem. May, may, I, may I just quickly add that we're talking about COVID, but remember COVID is just an indication, the obvious outside indication unveiling a system of health needs in this country. We actually um, don't have more Black physicians than we had uh, 20 years ago or 30 years ago. That's atrocious. That's ridiculous. Why is it that if we know that that people of color trust people of color, that we're not putting out more physicians that are people of color, that are African-American or Latinx or uh, First Nations? We're not doing that. So there's a bigger system than COVID. And yes, we need to focus on COVID, but I am now looking at the broken system of healthcare and wellness in this country from the legacy of enslavement and the role of capitalism in this country where you do what you do to get ahead. And that may be on the backs of somebody else or that may be at the consequence of somebody else not doing well. I am personally with you at a place of retirement saying time out for that. And I'm, I'm, I'm more vocal, I'm more uh, just downright irritated by it. And I know that I can do something there whereas my colleagues who are coming along may not be in those positions, but we can do it. We so can. What, I, what we can. I want you to, to get from my presentation was step up to the plate for such a time as this to make the decisions that you can make. Even Lisa just sending me that email was such an encouragement. She didn't have to do that, but she did it because that was her role to play in just a little bit encouragement for me that's doing something else. You have a role to play in somebody's life even just hosting this forum or coming to this institute for this week is a choice you've made in the right direction uh, for Cherish and her other classmates, making the choice to be the best veterinary scientist as a, and as a student who's active as you can, all of these things make a difference. Let us look back as to where we've come from so we can go back and get what our forefathers did. They did so many things. Those teachers who taught in the black schools we're doing so much more than teaching children math and science and English. They were empowering them. And Dr. McIntyre and I are, are examples of this. And I'm sure Dr. Warren and Dr. Hodge, who have been empowered by those who believed in us and taught us that you got to be, you got to try harder. You got to do more because you're representing more than yourself. So I'm saying we need to get to that same attitude where each person 
is doing what they can. And, and some of the generation, like Cherish a Generation, you might be out in the street protesting in ways that I can't do because I'm just not gonna do that yet. But you and your colleagues do what you can do. And together we break the back of this institutional and systemic racism and um, inequities and deliberate systems of inequities. Some people call it white supremacy, but I refuse to use that term because ain't nothing supreme about white, right? And I'm not gonna oh. <laughs> give it the language that it can even think so. So it's, uh, as a, a colleague said, it's, it's deliberate systems of inequities that are perpetuated across generations and by systems, institutions, not individuals, but systems and institu institutions where decisions are made by individuals. And so we need to take this opportunity while it's at forefront at the end of this pandemic and break the back of what has occurred in this country. It's time out. It's time out for, for these inequalities, particularly surrounding our health. And let me say this about this misinformation, disinformation stuff. And one of the things that's so concerning is that a lot of it um, really impacts us more um, from the standpoint of um, what is occurring, which is why it is so important to be vocal and to provide the resources that people need, which is why I say, what is it that you need? What do you need? Okay, because um, I've heard people say, well, you work for public health, so you gonna tell me anything. No, I'm not. Okay, I have no re reason to do that. And that's what I told them. You know, I am, I am actually was supposed to already be out of here, but I'm not because my goal was to do as much as I could to get stuff going and before I leave, okay? And like I told them, I said, you know, I really don't need have to be here, but I'm here because I want to be here. Um, and I want to make sure that we protect and save as many people as we can, because there's no reason for people, you know, there were folks that I had worked with in my church with my health ministry um, that were in the healthcare system. And this was before the vaccine was available. People that have been working with for almost 30 years that died trying to do their jobs. That's all they were doing. Simply doing their jobs. You know, we had to fight for um, PPE to get adequate supplies of um, PPE to get stuff for people to be able to protect themselves. A lot of, and that's what I tell people, a lot of the folks out there that are the regular people in the communities, you all really have no idea how rough and bad it's been for those people that have been trying to provide the care to you. Okay, and then here we go last month with numbers, out the roof in the month before that were almost as high as we saw in January, February. And, you know, I had just taken a, a breath, a deep breath and say, I actually see light at the end of the tunnel and it lasted for less than four weeks. Right back. And then here we went, flying on up. Numbers actually, from the standpoint of ICU, worse than they were in January and February. Not equivalent, worse. More people dying. Yep. Okay, more people dying. It's just not, y'all, it's, it's extremely hard. People crying, and I'm going to say this. We have cried, folks have cried. People are people probably more with depression and the stress and the anxiety. People are human. And that's what I told some of the folks out there who were fighting and battling against putting on a mask. You're fighting against don't want to put a mask on when you've got people that have worked 36 and 48 hours that they cannot even get um, a rail or anything to eat, but you won't put a mask on, which could keep you out of the hospital or somebody else to give them a break, okay? Oh, I almost have nothing to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, you know, um, like, like the rest of you, I have family members who make up all kinds of excuses for why they won't take the vaccine. And some of them are just downright silly. Like I may go a third ear, or I might go a nipple on the heel of my foot. I saw this guy on, T on, a, on YouTube who said this, that, and the other. And my response is always the same. Two responses. One is, I've never seen a third nipple or a third ear, but for darn sure, I've seen death from COVID. Yeah. So take your pick. Then I say, Here's an easy option for you. Go ahead and make a list. Two, two, get two sheets of paper. Make a list 
of everyone who you've just heard of who died from the vaccine. Just heard it, even if it's anecdotal, just heard about it. Put that person's name on the list. Now make a second list of everyone who you know personally who've died from COVID. And then put those, those lists side by side and see which one wins. Now, in every instance, I could imagine, even if it's just General Colin Powell passing a couple of weeks ago, or the two reporters, which is a totally different context, the two talk show hosts, two or three, three talk show hosts who were committed non vaxxers considered com committed non maskers and they died, right? And their last words were always, is it too late? <laughs> Can I take the vaccine now? <clears throat> Why would you want that to be a legacy? So we do these, we do what we do now because just um, um, because in, in 1932 to 1972, yes. 623 men in Alabama, Macon County were not given the option. That's right. They were not given the option of penicillin. They were not given the option of health care. It was refused them. Now we have a chance. The difference between, as you said, the I think it was Dr. McIntyre, um, one of you, you all sound exactly the same because you're both from the country. The difference between <laughs> the, the difference between the, the men on the vaccine, I'm oh, sorry, the men on the, the so-called syphilis study and the vaccine is one was an un ethical decision not to treat. And this is an ethical decision to treat. Completely are different things. So we are we are we are the we are the crossroads, right? Because Dr. Warren, myself, or colleagues, and you mentioned it today more than enough times, trustworthiness. We have to demonstrate ourselves to be trustworthy. That is all of us, each of us who are in the public eye, having this conversation, sometimes almost every day, saying the same things. Well, the, the, the COVID-19, the vaccine, it just came out too fast. Ah, COVID-19 vaccine is the same as COVID-17 vaccine. They just put a different engine in the old car and let it ride. That's all. It, well, it, it's not that they just started from scratch. <laughs> they already had the, 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 the methodology. They just tweaked it and set it up there. We've been taking vaccines all of our life. Nobody asked me as a baby whether to give me all these vaccines that popped in my body, but I'm still here without polio, without measles, without chicken pox, without and a host of other things. So, but at the same time, nobody told me Dr. Warren was in Popeye chicken, <laughs> but I ate, I I have eaten that in the past. Nobody told me it was in KFC. I don't understand it's a nasty crap. I've eaten that in the past. So why should I be concerned about, um, why should I be so over-concerned about a vaccine where more people, 90% of people who take the vaccine are surviving 2%, maybe dying? Come on, that's not, a, that's not a good statistic that you want to bet your life on. So I want to thank, uh, but before, first of all, I want to thank uh, my oh, dear sister, Cherish Hillman. We'll come back to uh, presented, but, uh, but uh, our biological honor student, Cherish, we appreciate your presence and we thank God for you. We thank God for, for your legacy and for following the legacy. Dr. Warren Cherish is going to be your veterinarian. She's going to take care of animals. I don't know. That's not what I would do with my life. <laughs> Dealing with iguanas and such. I want nothing, no part of it. I'm terrified of frogs. It takes a gift that we have that kind of spirit. So Cherish, we thank you. We appreciate you um, being moderating this session today. Thank you for choosing me. You're welcome. You're welcome, Cherish. Um, um, secondly, um, before we before I move it along further, um, Dr. Warren, before you give your keynote opening, do there anything that you want to share mm -hmm. to Dr. McIntyre and Dr. Fuller? Yes, I'm, I'm uh, simply overwhelmed by what I knew. I knew I would hear. Uh, we've, you, Dr. Hodge, we've been wrestling with the sacred and the secular since we've been working together. And this was a combination of the both. It's no difference, it's one and the same. And you heard it from the, the top scientists, the top clinicians, and then you heard that, that segue into the faith. 
and without apology. So let, let, let and you won't get this kind of form any place else but here. Of uh, what I don't know what I've missed, but I know what I heard. Um, Dr. Fuller's brother is a Tuskegee vet. Let's connect it. Let's not get it twisted. Ain't no better place to be a vet than Tuskegee. So we had to get her back. And she's working with the top of the folk in the country, if not the world, making sure that what we are uh, provided with is the best science available. So we can't thank you enough for that. And Dr. McIntyre, we, we go back, back in the day and you continue to, 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 to launch the kind of message that cannot be denied no matter where you are and, and no matter who's listening. So this has been a powerful, powerful segue. I couldn't miss this. I was driving too fast and I had to call Dr. Hyde and say, please doc, let me come in safe. And so I wasn't even worried. I knew if he had it, it was done. And I hope you're here and I'll, and I'll be quiet. I hope you hear this notion of trustworthiness. Everybody that we're talking to has had time together to prove themselves trustworthy to each other. So we don't have to talk about trust, talk about what can you do for what we need to get done. And it was done overwhelmingly. Now, let me, let me close. And then I will close because I have uh, some special gifts. Is it time, Dr. Hodge, for me to give? Oh, not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet. Okay, well, let me hold on because I'm bubbling up. <laughs> okay. No, let me turn it back. Uh, 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 I, now I want to say to you, um, Dr. McIntyre, Dr. Fuller, I, I just love the both of you. How you started you're from the country. Um, uh, I want to make mention of a couple of people on here. One is Attorney Latifa Muhammad, and she's quoting when she says, deliberate systems of inequities. I love it. We should memorize that. Deliberate, let's say slowly, deliberate systems of inequities. In other words, it's not accidental that of the excess death categories, the eight excess death, death categories, black and brown people lead in those categories. That cannot be a historical accident. That's a reality. And that reality is something that can be counted and turned around, but it takes this kind of conversation and not this, but whatever we gain from this to take it from here and, and take it to others. So deliberate systems of inequities. Um, I also want to mention that our dear sister from the, from the CDC, Joe Valentine, and I call her our sister because she's our sister. She, wherever, whatever she do, whatever we do, she's right there with us. So um, sister Joe Valentine, she has the admirable and sometimes very really tough job of, of putting together the, um, the, the, um, the summer internship for our bioethics honor students. And so she pulled that whole team together to have the kind of uh, pieces. And this year we had, <laughs> it was extremely challenging because we had to do it on Zoom. And because we would prefer that our students be in the, in the grind, the hands getting dirty up in there, you know, in there, but they had to do it online. So it was a different kind of challenge, but we got it done. Um, but Dr. I mean, uh, Ms. Joe Valentine is the person who see it. We love her. We love her. We love her. She's always there for whatever we need. She's there for us. So we thank you, Ms. Valentine, um, because the first thing she said is very, very well done, Cherish. And so we appreciate your presence, Ms. Valentine. And so, um, so now I turn it back over to Dr. Warren, and he's going to do two things. One, he's going to say some very nice things and offer you a very nice thing, and then. Dr. Warren is going to give us his opening plenary before we take a brief break and go into a final session of today. Uh, Dr. Warren. Again, I, I wanted to uh, thank you, Dr. Hyde, for uh, demonstrating how we work together in the National Center for Bioethics in Research and Healthcare. Uh, we work closely together, so if one is out for whatever reason, the next person just flows right in. So uh, publicly, thank you, Dr. Hyde, for, for your hard work. Uh, this this is what we do. These, the people that we've invited are the best available. And they bring their expertise and they bring their, their commitment. And I hope that that's coming clear. But also what's most important for, for us is the students that we are obligated to give all that we have. And so every time we have this kind of event, we engage our students, particularly the bioethics honor students. Dr. Hodge works diligently with them regularly and frequently to help them to grow and to being all that they can be. So this is just a tremendous, a tremendous honor. Let me say this, that 
uh, we could not pay you for what you've given to us today. We wouldn't even insult you by trying to. What we want to do is say thank you in many, many ways. And thank you comes in many versions, but there's, there's a thank you that comes from Tuskegee that you cannot get any place else in the world. And what we have a, a, a coin, a Tuskegee coin that was minted by a colleague, a Reverend Leonard, who's from Tuskegee, been here for many years, and he developed these coins because he wanted symbols of what Tuskegee represents. And so we're giving the gold coin um, to Dr. Fuller. And it, it, it says, and you can't see it fully, but you'll see it when you get it. On one side, it says it has Booker T. Washington, the founding president of Tuskegee University. On the other side, it has the, what you see, uh, uh, lifting the veil. And so the gold, the gold coin goes to our keynoter and the silver coin goes to our respondent. So these will be in the mail for both of you in addition to a hard copy of the, of the uh, program for your, for your records. And again, a, a, a simple, a small honor to tell you thank you. Uh, I don't know how to say it other than say thank you. And we look forward to you participating in the other days of the activity and the rest of the, the activity for the commemoration. Thank you so much. That is so special. I'm going to just share that with my big brother as soon as I can. But thank you so much. I, of course, Dr. Carver is um, just an icon in, 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 in the world. And so I am so humbled and honored. Thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Warren. Yeah, we go way back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and um, it's been a long day and I won't um, prolong it with saying what I wanted to say in the beginning of this opening, but I'll say it briefly. There's nothing more important from my perspective than maintaining the legacy of the men that were in the U.S. Public Health Service CIFA study at Tuskegee. What you've heard, uh, much of it is not correct. And we believe that the people who know them best are the descendant family members. So we've been working from, from the time I got here, from before, but more uh, intimately from, from 2009 with the uh, family, the descendant family members, the Voices for Our Fathers Legacy Foundation. And we work very closely together. And I promised uh, uh, Ms. Head and, and the other descendant family members, if they say, no, we ain't doing it. So it's not an issue of trying to convince them uh, to do what we think is important. We engage, we, they're all over the world now, uh, and they've taken the leadership role in making sure the truth is told, because much of what we heard is, is not true. And we've been adamant about not using the word Tuskegee syphilis study. That's trouble if you come on this campus using that because it's a distortion, you know? Uh, it was United States Public Health Service syphilis study at Tuskegee, that's what we grabbed. But the original name, the Tuskegee syphilis, the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in Macon County. There are four important components about that. First, they said Tuskegee study because they had the context for understanding the impact that Tuskegee has on the world. So to say Tuskegee gives legitimacy to anything anybody wanted to do. The other thing, untreated syphilis. In other words, they had no intention of providing any kind of care, untreated syphilis. The third is as if syphilis was only infecting black people. It was a pandemic, excuse me, an endemic and pandemic in fact. And so we really, and the fourth is they said Macon County. They followed the men all over the world. They had a perfect surveillance system, Dr. McIntyre, but the system was to put, to deny care and opposed to provide care. So it's perfect. So we've interrupted that. And we moved from as the legacy, the, uh, the, the Tuskegee uh, family members so, say so loudly, we moved from trauma to triumph, from trauma to triumph. So we're not talking about the horrors that was done. We recognize and repeat that when necessary, but we're talking about how do we move from here? And we're moving in fantastic ways. The session yesterday was just, was just overwhelming. 
uh, the opening session, the healing session was was overwhelming. And I can't thank the the the, the descendants family members enough for what they did yesterday and what they're going to do tomorrow and from now on. So let me close by saying thank you. And I am so excited about today, but more excited about tomorrow. We started off in a way that could not cannot be matched. I don't think. But come tomorrow and we'll see.